Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday, May 8th workshop of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, the purpose of tonight and the next two workshops is specifically to review the draft of uh, the updated comprehensive plan. Um, <clears throat> the comprehensive plan uh, is the product, uh, the draft that we have is the product of a, a, a very thorough and productive effort uh, on the part of the comprehensive plan committee. Uh, two of whose members are here with us tonight, the Chairman Tim Thompson and one of the members, Peter Curry. Thank you both for being here. Um, I want to again express my gratitude to y you both and, and all the members of the committee and to Maureen, uh, our town planner, um, for the hours and hours of, of work that you put into this. Um, it's an extremely significant undertaking, um, but one that's also very important. And for the benefit of those watching tonight or maybe watching uh, later on, um, I want to encourage people to continue to engage in this process. Um, I know that there was some good, robust discussion um, and community input that was um, garnered and, and uh, sought throughout the process of developing the draft comprehensive plan. Um, this is now the town council's opportunity to start to dig in, uh, digest, discuss, and deliberate uh, on the findings of the comprehensive plan committee. Um, so I want to encourage people to continue to stay active and engaged in the process. Um, and, and for anyone who just doesn't understand what the comprehensive plan is, um, you know, it is truly sort of our, our vision document that guides a lot of the planning and policy work uh, that will frankly go on for the you know, better part of the next decade uh, within the community. Um, so I often, uh, whether it be at a planning board meeting or, um, you know, some issue that might come before the council, um, you know, you'll, you'll see people at sort of what I'd describe as an 11th hour, um, you know, start to get um, invested in an issue or, or maybe uh, raise concerns or, you know, advocate for their position relative to something that's immediately before one of the decisioning bodies in town. It's actually at this point, um, through the review of the comp plan and ultimately the, the approval and acceptance of the comp plan, that this is the time to have the best input into a lot of the issues that wind up coming before uh, the planning board or the council at a later date. Um, it's, the, it's the information and the guidance and recommendations that are set forth in the comp plan that really guide and shape a lot of our um, ordinances, a lot of our strategic planning, um, and a lot of the direction the town heads in. And so um, I, I really encourage people to either either watch these proceedings, all three of these uh, workshop meetings that we're going to have tonight, again on May 15th and then on May 22nd, they're all going to be uh, televised and archived as well, or come out to the town council chambers um, to join us and, and voice your opinion, send us emails. Uh, things like that. All of the documents uh, are available on the town website. Um, I think this is still under the hot topic section, so it's easily accessible. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to sort of use that to tee up um, what we're going to get into tonight and, and underscore sort of the, um, the importance um, that a comprehensive plan has, because I think for a lot of people it sort of exists in this abstract and they don't really understand what it is or what it does or why it has any value. and. Um, it is something that is, is really important for the community. Um, for the purpose of tonight's agenda, we're going to be covering uh, a number of different uh, chapters and topics within the comp plan. Um, they're outlined in the agenda, but I'll read them off here as well. Um, we'll get a summary of what public participation happened. We're going to review population and demographics, the economy, transportation, housing, public facilities and services, Fiscal Capacity and Capital Investment Plan, Natural Resources, Agriculture and Forest Resources, Marine Resources, Water Resources, Historic and Archaeological Resources, and then we'll have a wrap-up. And like I said, we will then have subsequent meetings on the 15th and the 22nd uh, to continue through other chapters of the plan. So before I turn it over to Maureen for our introduction, um, uh, is there anybody else? Uh, from the council that wishes to uh, make any comments or uh, raise any points? 
Matt, anything from you? No, sir. All right, <laughs> Maureen, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank I, you very much. I, I'm trying to keep track of the schedule that was our guideline, but I am gonna take um, two minutes out of that just to go over six points that I hope will make the rest of the review go easier. Um, point one, I wanna make sure that council understands that this is the committee's plan, um, not my plan. They met 26 times, they held three public forums, um, the nine members represented the town council, the school board, the planning board, and five members of the public. Uh, they led 18 community presentations to community groups all over town, and they moderated all the online uh, conversations about different issues that were posted on the website. Uh, so it's important to understand uh, it's their plan. Uh, the second point is state certification. When the, when the town council created the committee, uh, the one goal they gave them was to make sure you can write a plan that will try to comply with the state certification. So there is something called the comprehensive plan rule. I think you got sent it last week and it's kind of a chunky bit. Um, the thing to keep in mind is there are things that the state expects to have in a plan and we have tried to put those in the plan you may read them and say, that doesn't really seem like it's that important to Cape Elizabeth, but it checks the box for when we have to submit it to the state. Uh, we tried to address state goals, and you'll see that there are many recommendations that talk about retaining, continuing the things the town is already doing. The reason we put that in the plan is because when we acknowledge we're already doing these things, we can show that we're already meeting state goals. Um, and the last piece on that is when you are writing recommendations, and I would expect that this group may want to change or write new recommendations, the state requires that they be measurable. So, you know, improve affordable housing is a great goal, but you need a specific recommendation, something that someone else can look back five or eight years from now and see whether you did it. Um, so it has to be something specific enough that you can create a measurement. Uh, the third thing I want to point out is that the comprehensive plan is the legal foundation for your land use regulations. And Cape Elizabeth has a hefty group of land use regulations, seems to be pretty um, enthusiastic about keeping those regulations. And so um, in order to have those regulations, you need to have this legal underpinning, which is the comprehensive plan. The plan and the regulations need to be consistent. They don't have to be lockstep, but they can't be contradictory. And you can make recommendations in your comp plan that are not consistent with your current regulations. But it means you do need to be willing to then amend your regulations to come into compliance with your new policies. Uh, the plan organization. Uh, towns can make any kind of organization to the plan they want. The committee decided that these sets of chapters made sense. They line up really nicely with the state comprehensive plan goals. They chose to group them in the ways they group them for those particular reasons. Um, one of the things you need to be careful about is because the word comprehensive inherently means there's a lot of overlap and it's already a fairly hefty document. There were lots of topics that really cover more than one chapter, uh, and the committee tried to be very disciplined to pick one place to discuss an issue and to discuss it well in that one place. And if you really needed to talk about it in other places, to reference its home. A good example of that is Fort Williams Park. Um, there was a decision that Fort Williams Park would live in the open space and recreation chapter, but there's clearly lots of issues that relate to Fort Williams Park. We're trying to keep pointing towards the open space and recreation chapter instead of repeating the same thing over and over. Um, Comparison communities. There are many places where we have data and lots of times data isn't that valuable unless you can compare it to other people. And there was a decision made, and these are pretty much the same communities we've been comparing ourselves to for 30, 40 years, that Cumberland, Falmouth, Yarmouth, Scarborough, because it's in a butter, and it's a, it's a suburban community, and South Portland. Those are our five comparison communities that you'll keep seeing come up every time we try to do a group arrangement of data. And that leads to the last piece, um, data. Um, as we've discussed at the committee, and I think the, concert, the council has discussed, the US Census is the best data. It is, it is by far the largest sampling. It's supposed to be a count. Um, and the last census was in 2010, which was a long time ago. 
Um, so we can do some sampling, but sampling, especially for Maine and even more especially for the town of Cape Elizabeth, tends to be very, very low, which means your error rate is very, very high. Um, I just give you that caution. And we had that discussion, and I think I provided you with a memo that we received from the Greater Portland Council of Governments. They helped us collect data for the top five data-heavy chapters, and they acknowledged that some of the data is not that great. It's old or it's dated. Um, but as a group, you're going to have to decide what you find acceptable. There are things the state expects us to provide, and I unfortunately think we have to give them old data versus no data. Um, and the one last piece is um, updating data can be deceptively time consuming. So um, the data package we got from the state we received in the fall of 2016 in anticipation of the council establishing the committee in 2017. And we're now in 2019. So as you read this, some of these dates are gonna look a little old. If we have to go back and update those numbers, we can do that. But my, my, my suggestion as a staff person would be to decide when it's more important to update the data, especially if trends aren't changing, and when it's more important to put staff time into implementation. And Matt will tell you I'll work on anything you want. So are there any questions with that, or shall we go on? Because we're now eight minutes behind. Okay, so um, the first chapter you are going to be looking at is not moving, is the public participation chapter. Um, the town hired a public participation consultant. The Comprehensive Plan Committee interviewed uh, two very good candidates and chose uh, the person they hired, which was Judy Colby George. And she uh, was, I think, invaluable in helping the committee. So the big, we also hired a separate consultant to do a public opinion survey, and that is appendix one in this report. It is listed for review next week, not this week. But you'll see that the, the, the plan is salted with answers that were provided from the public opinion survey in different chapters. So, um, we had the public opinion survey. We had 783 responses. Uh, the survey was done by mailing a postcard out to every household in Cape Elizabeth, and then people could either um, use the, the postcard and call and fill out the survey, or they could link up directly to the website. We had over 400 people just use the website, so the website is gonna be repeated as a big, big deal in terms of public participation. All the committee's agendas, minutes, meeting materials, were all posted on the website. The um, online forum where we collected over 200 comments from people and a whole range of questions, that was also posted on the website. Uh, we had three public forums where we reviewed all the chapters of the plan and um, a lot of the meat of that is also in appendix two. So with that, I'm gonna stop and see if there are any questions on the public participation. I guess I'll, I'll begin. So I'm gonna have relatively very few comments tonight. Um, uh, focusing just on the key findings though for the, the one approach that I took as I went through here is I put on basically my critical thinking hat and wherever there's an assertion, I say what's the support for the assertion. So focusing just on the key findings, uh, the first key finding I can see where that is in the document, which is a variety of public particip participation opportunities have been provided. Um, I, I would note that the prior draft said, oh, it was gonna list the 18 uh, public participation events that occurred. Uh, this eventually didn't have it. I was curious, A, why uh, that list isn't in here. And then my uh, primary question though is the second finding, public opinion survey resulted in an excellent response rate. What's the basis for the assertion we have an excellent response rate and what would be an average response rate? Okay, so as I said earlier, this is the plan of the committee and earlier drafts were revised and this was the draft that was approved by the committee. Um, I would suggest that all the detail of each of those meetings is in appendix two. So I, I'll leave that up to you if you wanna take the information from appendix two and move it into the body of the public participation chapter. Um, the excellent response rate is there's no specific 
data I can point to. I can tell you my understanding from other public opinion surveys is that when you do a mailed paper survey, 5% is considered an excellent response rate. And this was not a mailed survey, it was a mailed postcard with um, an opportunity to either call the number in the postcard to participate or to go online, and we had about an 8%. So everyone that I've spoken to who knows about surveying has agreed that this is a really hefty, nice uh, response rate. And so I would just uh, say I have a different opinion on that, but again, it's just my opinion. My vague recollection is if you look at surrounding communities, a good response rate for a comprehensive plan would be closer to 30%. So it, we'll, we'll just agree to disagree on that. And that's all I have on this chapter. Any other questions or comments? Um, I just have a typo. Um, on page eight, under Strawberry Festival kickoff, um, third line down says what the loved. Line seven. Line seven yep. and eight, the, and then change should be changed. Okay. Thank you. Um, Following up on Chris's question, um, setting aside the question of whether or not the, the sort of subjective question of excellent versus average or so on, you would characterize the response as statistically significant though, correct? I cannot call it statistically significant. And the reason I can't is because there was no randomness in how the respondents were chosen. Uh, when the last comprehensive plan was done, uh, we hired uh, someone to do a telephone survey, and the people they called was random, were randomly selected. And you need that element of randomness in order to call it statistically significant. The committee decided that um, this was the consultant they wanted. Um, the consultant then decided that he wasn't going to be doing a telephone survey. He was instead going to be doing a mailed postcard card survey, the committee accepted that approach, and um, I, I would say that 800 respondents is a very good response rate. But if the council wants me to change excellent to some other word, I certainly can do that. Um, and without the information right immediately at my fingertips, remembering from the appendix, um, when you factor in all of the other public outreach opportunity that there was, whether it be forum comments or actually meetings held and things like that, I, th I think if, if we wanted to put a total community engagement number on it, it would be well north of 8% of the community, 8.4% of the community, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, the, the community, I did do some art I'm adding up here. The community meetings, I think we hit about two to 300 people, if I remember correctly. And then we had, uh, I'm not counting the number of people we talked to at the, at the Strawberry Festival, because we really didn't have anything to say at that. Um, we probably had 100 people at public forums. And um, we had, I don't know, over 200 comments on Lumio. Now, obviously, there's overlap there. But if you, if you even with overlap, I, I feel comfortable that we've reached over 1,000 residents of the town. Uh, maybe that's not true, and, you know, we'll find out. Okay. Councilman Bourbon. Go ahead. Uh, so to follow up on the statistical significance, was there any mechanism put in place to prevent uh, an individual from submitting, say, 200 or 300 of those 700-odd responses? Our, our, and Penny's looking and kind of nodding, and that makes me feel better. So uh, yes, we did talk to the consultant at length, and he felt confident that he could um, check IPO addresses, et cetera, to make sure that respondents were only responding once and that they were Cape residents. 
So did a few people slip in? Maybe. Um, but there, that, that was fairly rigorous. And, and actually to get back to the statistically significant, because that was a concern I had, um, we did ask the consultant to look at the people who responded demographically. And his response was he felt comfortable that the demographic groups represented the people who live in caves. So there was a certain percentage that were seniors, a certain percentage that were younger, and he felt that it was a good representative sampling. Can I? That should have been the word I was actually reaching for before. Statistical is a good word. Statistical, yeah. but anyway. Can I, um, Maureen, I know that when we talked about the phone survey, one of the challenges was the um, uh, the not a lot of landlines in Cape Elizabeth. Um, homes had multiple uh, cell phones. It became more difficult to execute on a phone survey than to, and we discussed, I think, quite a bit, how do we accomplish the same thing? Um, uh, and so when we went to the postcard approach, that was um, kind of our way of trying to achieve the same thing. Um, and so I, I think that we, we tried our best to reach the greatest number of people. I think that, um, that the various mechanisms we used for outreach um, uh, got a, a good cross-section of citizens. Um, and we tried to leverage technology as much as we could, but recognize that not everybody had access to technology. So. Totally agree. Unless anybody has any other points, I just want to help Maureen in keeping us on track here, so or getting us back on track. So, uh, any other points on the public participation? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move along. Okay. So our next chapter is population chapter, and I call it population and demographics. Um, it's one of the most important chapters because uh, it has a lot of data about what the town is looking like now, where the town is going. Um, I can just give you some highlights and then go to questions. I think the data shows, well, first of all, remember the last census was the 2010 census, and so that is the first thing you get out of this is um, there are some limits in what we're providing in terms of timely data. Uh, I think all the data shows that there's no strong growth in Cape Elizabeth. That, that we, it, when we talk about growth, we talk about slow, we talk about steady. Uh, there is never any suggestion that we're going to have an explosion of any kind of growth in terms of population, in terms of housing. Uh, the second piece is the population groups, and uh, it's no surprise that Cape Elizabeth is getting older, and the data we had actually, you know, showed that, that, that the trend nation nationally is for there to be uh, older people and not so many younger kids, and that's what we find in Cape, that we have a decline in the zero to five age group. We have an increase in the folks 80 and older. We see our household size continuing to creep down to 2.49 people per household, which matches up with fewer, with more people in single person households. And if you think about people getting older, you understand why that happens. Um, there is an increase in the single person households. Um, not, again, not a surprise, um, household income, Cape Elizabeth is $101,000, which is very high for the state, uh, very high for the county, we're, we're second after Falmouth, and that income reverberates through other chapters and other pieces of policy that we need to look at. And then the last piece is Cape Elizabeth is extremely well educated. Can I ask? Go ahead. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I want to kind of reconcile the um, the information that um, Councillor Straw has provided because I think there's um, a lot of consistency in in what is said from. Um, a, uh, statistics perspective. Uh, the only nuance I see, and Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, the major nuance I see is the um, 
the 41% of the increase of the population under five. It seems that we're in agreement that the population um, is aging, but we also have a bookend which says there's uh, people younger than, than five years old. Is that the, um, the primary difference? Uh, so, uh, in part, basically it's, um, when I look at the data, um, I don't see slow and steady growth. What I see is stagnation. Um, it, it, okay. I look at from decade to decade there, if you go back to 1970, uh, we have numerous decades where there's no, no growth. Mm -hmm. For example, 2000 to 2010, we actually shrank as a town. Mm -hmm. So that's my issue with the first point. But then much of it is rooted in that third point where the claim is made that the under five population has decreased 50%. So why does this really matter at the end of the day? Can um, I ask a question? Uh, sure, go ahead. Um, because what I look at is that uh, that piece, if that, if that holds true, then the ripple effect is through uh, services, schools, et cetera. So we can say that uh, from a, a population perspective that yes, we agree there's an aging population which we need to address services for as well. But let's recognize that there's also this bookend that we need to be cognizant of. So as we travel through this plan as a team, uh, let's keep that in mind to ensure that we are uh, um, incorporating that piece. So I then have a question because there's an assumption in that that says that that 41% uh, growth is going to stay in this town, that little population, those short little people, um, that are, they're going to stay in this town. Um, and so we maybe have to agree that that assumption can hold true. But it says let's recognize that there's potential bubble coming at us, yep. and let's recognize. Is that kind of exactly. where you're headed? Exactly. You hit okay. the, the nail on the head. It's basically if this, if the statement in the draft of under five populations decreased nearly 50 percent was accurate, uh, I personally would be, feel hard pressed to say support um, the proposal in the current budget to, uh, for the uh, the plan for revising the facilities, mm -hmm. because instead it's like, oh my God, our schools are shrinking. Why in the world would we spend money renovating these schools if we're only going to need half the facilities in the future? So I, it's exactly what you just said, uh, not to rehash it, but it's basically it needs to be accurate so that we do, uh, plan for mm -hmm. growth, like you just said, and uh, allocate resources uh, appropriately based on the actual demographics of the community. Mm -hmm. And that is really the primary data point that you have a delta on that you would want. If I were to choose the primary one, yes. Okay. It's the, uh, my opinion is the town is actually growing younger, um, not getting older, in that uh, the underage, uh, under five population is exploding. So. Okay. okay. I think that's important for us to all wrap our heads around because as Maureen said in the onset is that these frame all of our thinking that will go from this point forward through this document. Chris, can I ask you to just um, maybe give a high level, so, so we have before us what you shared um, to the council. Um, I don't know if it made it up into the packet it, it before is. the, it did, okay. So, um, but can, can you maybe just touch on at a very high level um, the sort of the, the, the key points that you've made and what you shared with us and specifically um, maybe reference the citation and data source for for what you're talking about. Sure, to try to keep it as concise and brief and uh, digestible as possible. As the town planner noted, the, the big issue is we're not dealing with census data. This is a, from a temporal perspective about the absolute worst time we could be doing this because we get the census is next year. So the census data is almost 10 years old. So instead what the Census Bureau does is it issues something called the American Community Survey. Uh, if you're a large town like uh, San Francisco or New York or Boston, that 
uh, survey that they issue is actually highly accurate. But when you're a small community like us of about 9,000 people, as the town planner noted, it's sampling size where they'll contact like 200 people in town. And because it's such a small number of people that you're reaching out to, you have a really good chance of missing small groups. Uh, so if you look at the actual data from the American Community Survey, what the original draft uses is the 2015 version. And what it says is we think there's 239 kids under the age of five. It, but it also says, but we think there's something like a 40% margin of error. So it could be 239, it could be 450 or something like that. So that's what the data actually says that's in the report. But what the report repeats is the 239 number without recognizing the margin of error. So what I did is I pulled the exact same data source, the American Community Survey, but instead of using the 2015 issue, I pulled the 2017 issue. So it's two years newer of data. And it directly contradicts what's in the comprehensive plan draft. Where the comprehensive plan draft said there's 239 kids under the age of five, the new draft, uh, or the new version of the American Community Survey has like over 400 something kids. So it shows actual growth. And, and just as a aside, I think it's 240 girls alone, so just girls alone is more than the number that's in the proposed comprehensive plan. So if you look at the trend over multiple American community surveys, what you see is a relatively consistent number being reported for kids under five, but then there's this blip for the 2015 year, which is then the data we ran with, and that blip is an outlier and is contradicted by all the rest of the years. So. That's what I, I realized that was probably way too long-winded, but that's what I attempted to capture with this. So I updated the data to reflect 2017 version of the ACS. Thank you. Um, first, any specific questions for Chris on that? Or seeking clarification in any way? I'm just curious, is there a way to cross-reference it with, and I know it's not every child goes to school in Cape Elizabeth, some are homeschooled or they go to private schools. Is there a way to reference some of that with our, yes. our schools? Yes, e excellent question. And that was part of why I got so um, bothered by this bullet point. Um, if you take the bullet point, which said 239 kids over five years, five cohorts, mm -hmm. divide by five, that's roughly 47 kids per grade. Mm -hmm. So we can look at actual enrollment at the school where the last kindergarten class was 110. So you, the data overlaps for that kindergarten class. The comprehensive plan says 47, actual enrollment figures are 110 roughly. So one of them is wrong. I'm gonna go with the actual enrollment numbers from the school rather than the estimate. And given that the estimate is less than half of what we have, that's why I was like, no, our kindergarten classes are getting bigger. We need to plan for it. We have to make sure we make sure there's enough kindergarten teachers to accommodate that. And that's why I see real world effects from this is we do need to keep in mind and make sure that if the entire goal of this is to allow us to plan as a community to uh, deal with future growth, uh, figuring out where to divert resources based on this is important. So, mm -hmm. so Maureen, I have two questions that I'm hoping you can answer um, on behalf of the committee. Um, number one, I know you can because we've, we've talked about it. Um, and the first is, because I'm sure it'll come up or somebody might be watching at home and saying, well, if this data is so old and you referenced it in your introduction, well, then why are we using it? Or in fact, why are we using, or why are we doing the update to the comp plan now? Um, so as you already alluded to, you know, the 2010 census is the most recent and most comprehensive of data sets available. But then the fact that we're doing our update to the, the plan now, even when there's a 2020 census about to be conducted, of which the results and data don't start to disseminate for like at least a year, year and a half, correct? So you're talking into 2022 um, before the, you know, and who knows with what's going on with the census, what schedule they'll keep or not. So anyway, long-winded way of asking, well, why are we doing this now? <laughs> um, number one, I know we asked, that's the, why the plan to be done the, the council did um, but also uh, there was a reason we asked and, and the reason why it gets done at these intervals and so if you could just maybe allude to that a little bit um, and and explain why while it's not ideal this is when we have to do it I, I, I'm sorry I, I would like to have a, a nice answer and, and the best I can do is I begged you not to start <laughs> <laughs> The, the problem is that a comprehensive plan is a significant effort. It's 
two plus years of resources that the town has, has invested in this. You've got a committee effort. Uh, you've got a staff effort. And as I've said before, there are things that are sitting on the shelf waiting to be addressed because they had to be put aside while the comprehensive plan was being done. If you decide not to use this and then you start all over in 2021, I mean, you have to question, is that the greatest use of resources in a community with very little growth? Mm -hmm. Usually comprehensive plans are more important to be updated when a community is changing rapidly. And CAPE is not changing rapidly. But I, I guess more broadly, if you could answer, that, well, while we're not specifically prescriptively uh, mandated to update it, there, there is a cadence to these things and a shelf life to the ones that, that are out there, right? Yes, there that, is. That's kind and, of what I was getting to. Right. And typically the state expects you to do a plan every 10 years. However, you know, the last plan was done in 2007. I was really hoping to wait until 2020. So the, the, the state was willing to wait until 2020. And I just can't come up here and say, yeah, you had to do it. So, but you chose to do it. So I, I kind of have to say, you know, are, aren't we, isn't that one kind of out the door already? So my second question um, is the point that Chris is raising. I'm just curious if you can um, enlighten us on what level of discussion and debate took place at the committee level around some of these points. Yeah, well, so, so there was a lot of discussion about the quality of the data and the realities of how long ago the U.S. Census was done. Um, I can tell you that there, there was so much conversation that a member of the committee called the U.S. Census. Um, and said she spent a lot of time, ended up talking to a woman in Virginia who works for the U.S. Census, and specifically talked about the zero to five population. And the answer that she conveyed to the committee was that the, the U.S. Census said, look, don't get hung up on 50%. It might not be a 50% decline. It might be a 30% decline. It might be a 70% decline. But nationally the population of zero to five year olds is declining and that the trend is the most important thing that's that's the one piece the the other pieces i have here and i can quote from it um, last year's uh, new york times article on birth rates and birth rates are continuing to decline so the question you have to ask, I would suggest you ask yourself is, do you think the trend is accurately represented or not? You know, we, we know from the 2000 census to the 2010 census, there was a decline in the number of zero to five year olds. We, we have this information at the national level that says there's a decline. We have birth rate data every single year that shows there's a decline. I don't, if the comp plan was suggesting uh, a huge decline, I might be a lot more concerned. But we're still in the 200 range, and you can hang your hat on the 50%, but when you're only talking about 290 something people, 50% isn't that many kids. So, I mean, one of the interim approaches might be to say that. You know, we can add a sentence that says, by the way, this year's, this, the 2019 kindergarten class has 100 number of kids, so this data should be, you know, approached with caution. I mean. I, Go ahead. I know I usually simplify things too much. Um, my question is, because we do have uh, new data, we do have data that's been presented to us that, um, and I guess it's, it's sort of the same thing Maureen is saying. It's like we, we can acknowledge it, acknowledge it exists and carry it through our work because if you look at everything else that's done in here and the recommendations that are made and uh, that you now say that we do have more five-year-olds than this 2010 data represented, um, or kids under five, um, why can't acknowledge it and carry it through? And as we review these sections, we ensure that we are 
cognizant of it, and we make sure that our recommendations and direction are aligned with it. Um, I, I don't see why we can't do that. I, I tend to agree. I also tend to look at, so the, the population demographics chapter is sort of laying a baseline that will be referred back to as we're actually setting goals and strategies in subsequent chapters. Exactly. There are no goals or strategies included in our population and demographics chapter. So what I'm looking at the data, as imperfect as it is, to, to tell us are, or to ask is, what are the subsequent goals and strategies that this data is going to inform? And from my perspective, that big trend line of a relatively stable overall population is very relevant to our land use and housing provision chapters. I tend to think that that overall population projection of stable population is probably pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. um, and then within that, looking at what the age breakdown is, that's going to inform decisions we're making about investments in schools, potentially community services, potentially things like um, transportation infrastructure for more active um, transportation, getting kids to and from schools, things of that nature. Um, I'm not given the relative age of our community currently, the fact that we have so many homeowners who have been in their homes for a long time and are going to sell their homes presumably to people who are younger than them at some point, I'm not even sure that looking at the zero to five age range is necessarily going to be the best predictor of what our school age population is going to look like in five mm. years. I think that housing 10 year turnover is going to have a much bigger impact. We can recognize that, and, and maybe what we want to do is include a strategy um, or an action under population demographics that asks us to look back, not to reinvent it, but you know, when we have better data from the 2020 census, um, if there are any changes that that would inform specifically as they relate to school population and, and things that would change. That's a big suggestion. I agree with the points you're making, Jeremy, because I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting is how, again, many of these topic areas overlap with one another, particularly in, even just within this chapter. So not even the multiple chapters in the plan, but even within this chapter. So you've got sort of this game of three-dimensional chess going on where, um, yes, there's a, a, a cohort of, you know, traditionally forecastable young people that would be a predictor of growth. At the same time, when you look at things like the real estate spread in town, you know, if you think about the composition of our housing stock and some of those houses that are going to become vacated, those aren't entry-level houses that people with one or no kids are moving into. You know, they're going to be more established. I, I think I agree. You know, they're not going to be empty nesters. They're not going to be retirees, but they're going to be, you know, people that are more economically established and may already have older children um, that are moving from another community, not just not just coming here to start their family, number one. And then there's another trend line in here that I find fascinating, and I would expect that the 2020 data is even going to show more of an uh, uh, upward trajectory on, and that's the seasonal housing. Um, so you've got this tension, these, you know, these pushes and pulls between things that discreetly, when you look at them on their own, seem highly contradictory to one another, but in some ways they might actually be complementary. And um, so how you you know, sort of factor that in and acknowledge that in a plan and then translate to um, findings and, and, and direction to take from it, I think is a very complicated exercise. So um, anyway, um, other comments or questions on this section? Can we? Yep. I, I loved your idea of having a goal in here to loop back. I thought that was an awesome idea because that will allow us to uh, recognize the uh, kind of the dynamics that happen around population. I thought that was great. Other points that people want to make before we move on? Anything else you wanted to say on this section, Maureen? OK. On to the economy. Well, we're only six minutes off. So. Not too bad. <laughs> we're getting there. So. Um, 
the economy chapter is uh, what it sounds like it's supposed to be. Uh, what it's telling us is that 90% of the Cape Elizabeth workforce, that's people who live here and have a job, are commuting someplace else. Uh, most of them have managerial and professional jobs. Uh, the biggest uh, categories for jobs in Cape Elizabeth are um, education and health care. We do not have what they call a major employer in Cape Elizabeth, but our largest employer is the Inn by the Sea and the town. Um, there has been a small increase in the number of jobs. We do have this location quotient idea, which is that are you producing more things than the people in the town need or less things than people in the town need? And we are producing much, much less, which means that people who live here are going elsewhere to uh, meet their needs and taking their dollars out of town as a result. Um, Let's see. And then I think, and I talked about the largest employer was the Inn by the Sea. So I don't know if there's anything else you want to go over on that, or do you want to go straight to the recommendations? I was curious a little bit about um, the last point in the key findings about telecommuting. <laughs> yes. Just generally. Any, any more detail you could go into on that as a key finding and then? No, I, th I think it was really more anecdotally. Okay. Um, the committee felt that there are more people that are doing that and I think you could see there's a slight decrease in the amount of people that are commuting out of town which suggests it's probably a combination of people who are telecommuting and potentially people who are retiring. From a policy perspective, um, implications for that uh, oh, the, from your, pers from your I, I view? Think, I think Councilor Jordan wants to take that one. <laughs> it came through uh, many times the number of people who, um, who um, acknowledged that the uh, broadband and um, cell service, et cetera, in town was not adequate for uh, future workforce people who decide that they can work from home and are working for a major corporation in New York City, uh, people who have their own home businesses. So it came out many, many times that our infrastructure from a um, ability for people to telecommute or to uh, do uh, significant work in their houses that require technology is lacking. So that's but I heard. Okay. So from a policy perspective, we need to put up a tower. <laughs> Other questions that people have? Go ahead, Councilor. Uh, short point, uh, goal four, the town shall continue to allow dot, 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 short-term rentals. Um, Where are you, Chris? Sorry. Sure, page 51. 51. So as noted, basically the comp plan trumps, is my understanding, ordinances and we basically can't do ordinances that are contradictory to the comp plan. Uh, we're, my understanding is this proposing basically codifying in the idea of short-term rentals such that we then, once this is passed, would be somewhat handcuffed outside of the limitation of subject to restrictions that protect the integrity and tranquility. Um, so I'm not comfortable with the short-term rentals being in goal four. If I could add something to that, um, and that's page, I've got page 40, yeah, that's, that's 40, say just 43, 43, 43. Right. so um, this was the first section that the committee worked on, they, got, they moved the goals around, this was what they came up with. Um, it's usually not a good idea to have your goal and your implementation step be the same thing, and you'll see in this chapter, that's what we have, but moving on. To address the specific concern, if for some reason the town decided not to have short-term rentals anymore, what you would need to do when you were adopting that regulatory change would be to also process a comprehensive plan amendment. And that doesn't happen very often. But it is some. It, it is a way to address that concern. I'm sorry, because I was. 
fumbling around trying to find where you were. Could you could you maybe just hit that again for me? Sure, we've got it up behind yeah, your so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it now. So. Uh, so the town shall continue to allow yeah. in-home businesses, daycare businesses, and then the part that yeah. gives me heartburn is the short-term rentals mm -hmm. and okay. other. So as it stands right now, my recollection is the current comp plan makes no mention of short-term rentals. So as people are probably aware, uh, they're somewhat controversial. Uh, if if we codify this, if we put this in a comp plan and it goes out to the voters, the voters pass it, um, that trumps us, the town council, so to speak, is my understanding. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, in that, the, 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 well, in Cape Elizabeth, you do not have to send the comprehensive plan out to the voters. It's adopted by the council. Uh, and and I, I alluded to the whole, it was a struggle to come up with this. And I mean, the original structure, there was a goal that talked about commercial activities that are outside commercial districts. So, I mean, the economy in Cape Elizabeth is basically in the commercial districts. But we also have a significant number of commercial activities that are happening in residential areas. And I'm sure all of you know that there's this almost constant tension um, between people who are, have been operating commercial establishments for a long, long time and people who are saying, hey, it's a residential zone, the only thing that should happen here is people living in single family homes. So the original intent of this goal was to try to create an umbrella for acknowledging that it's okay to have commercial activities in non-residential, in residential districts when they're respectful of those residential neighborhoods. And this is what they came up with. I guess where I'm, you could where, modify I'm, the shell. where my confusion stands too is how this runs contradictory to the codified ordinance around short-term rentals that we have. So um, it basically, uh, the town planner noted, so I was under the assumption that we're always sending these to the voters for uh, uh, the, uh, the approval yeah. or, or um, uh, rubber stamp or an agreement um, so that the voters can decide and that they then bind us going forward. If instead it is basically just treated as an ordinance where we can unilaterally change it without going to the voters, it alleviates some of the concern. Nevertheless, to get to your point about, well, we already have an ordinance that allows it. If, uh, let's say, the, CE, uh, the t code enforcement officer comes in next week and says, oh, you know, we've been getting a lot of complaints about these short-term rentals, and then we have some people from the community come in and they're like, you know, this is really a problem in our neighborhood. We really want you to re revisit this. Um, again, setting aside, it sounds like I was, I had a misunderstanding, but if to the extent it was, we were stuck with it because it was approved by the voters and we'd have to go to the voters to amend it, my concern was we then would be in a situation where if we said we shall, con we must continue to allow it, we would be in a situation where our hands are tied and we can't restrict it. But to the right, extent that we don't have to go to the voters, it alleviates. Well, yep. setting that point aside, I mean, it seems like this is actually catching the comp plan up to the existing ordinance, though. Well, I, I guess it turns <laughs> on whether you think short-term rentals are a good thing or not and my inclination is we should get rid of them because as you noted, it's chewing up inventory that I, I know families that have been trying to find houses in town and they just can't. Well, I don't think it is the way our yep. ordinance is structured though. Our ordinance is very limiting. Uh, I think of a couple buildings near me um, in particular where like there's one, I'm like, that's a beautiful house and it's being rented. I guess now they recently switched it to being a, a full year rental, but they had been doing short term rentals. So. Um, it's well, just a difference of a broader question of yep. whether or not there are people in town that are violating the existing short-term rental ordinance based on how they're renting their property. Yep. But the, the ordinance is quite clear about the limited opportunity they have to do that. And Got it. So yep. um, I, I, I think those are two separate issues. Fair enough. I, 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 yep. The way the ordinance is written, it's not designed to remove housing stock solely for the, we don't have a situation, or we shouldn't, uh, like what, you know, they've been debating and discussing in South Portland, for example. Got it. So, um, go ahead, Jeremy. Um, I, I take Chris's point, though, and, and also Maureen's point that I, I generally agree that there should be at least some daylight between the goal and the strategy. Um, and what I would suggest for this is um, for goal four, if, if we strike basically from businesses to in residential areas, um, it would read, the town shall continue to allow, strike in home, businesses in residential areas subject to restrictions that protect the integrity and tranquility of residential neighborhoods. 
I would also then suggest striking short-term rentals from um, the recommendation and we can subsequently decide if short-term rentals are or are not in fact a low impact commercial use. Maureen, I'm just working to pull it up here, but you probably know better than I off the top of your head the, the overview parameters of the existing short-term ordinance, because I know that you helped craft it, uh, helped the ordinance committee to craft it. Can you, uh, as I'm looking to pull that up, because I, I, don't, I don't know if everybody is familiar with it. Do you want me to go over it? Yeah. Okay, yeah, That'd sure. So um, we've defined short-term rental as a rental of 30 days or less. Um, so if you're or less than 30 days, so if you're renting more than 30 days, then it's just a regular rental and we don't regulate it any differently than any other residential use. Um, if you are renting out for, say, by the week, you can only rent your property once a week. If someone stays three days, you have to let it be empty the other four days. Um, you can rent your property out two weeks a year and you don't have to get a permit and it's considered, you know, the way to pay for your vacation. But if you rent it out for more than two weeks a year, you have to get a permit from the code officer when you do that. Um, you, the permit is $50, so it's not a revenue generating uh, 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 item. It's just uh, more of a life safety code item because the code officer does an inspection. He makes sure there's adequate egress lighting during an emergency. He checks for a few other things. There has to be an evacuation plan. You have to show this adequate parking and you get your permit. Um, you can renew your permit for three years without having an ins five years without an inspection as long as you assert there's been no material changes. And then there's the three strikes you're out provision. So um, we had some problems with some lots of fun times at some short term rentals. So if a complaint is made and it's, con it's verified, it's a verified complaint the police have gone they said yes this happened your first strike you have to meet the code with the code officer second strike you are shut down for 30 days third strike your permits revoked you're done for the season and for a lot of these folks they're signing contracts they're relying on the income and it seems like that is working really well I think there's only one or two people that have had to have the meeting with the code officer so the complaints have pretty much disappeared as far as I know right now so the only reason I am pressing on this is I, I know that, you know, a lot of people hear short-term rentals, they think of it as a, as a four-letter word. And, um, you know, prior to, you know, not to single you both out, but prior to you both being on the council, I know that the ordinance committee and some past counselors um, and working with the community members who, you know, are involved in these endeavors, um, put a lot of work into crafting what I think is a, an exemplary ordinance um, that other towns can frankly model after um, if they chose to um, and, and wouldn't have the same headaches that maybe they're experiencing. And, and, and uh, you know, conditions on the ground vary and, you know, what they're dealing with in South Portland isn't exactly what we would have had here and so on and so forth. But all I'm saying is that I don't think we should necessarily go running scared from the notion of short-term rentals and calling them out by name and things like that just because we've built in some good guardrails um, through our existing ordinance around this. And as um, Maureen just alluded to, um, you know, are having pretty good compliance with that. So um, anyway, that's that's the only comment I want to add on that. Chris? Uh, so it, it sounds like, uh, and I'm not familiar with the exact nuances, but it sounds like um, so long as I get a permit, if I'm a property owner, I can in fact rent my property uh, on a weekly basis for the entire year so long as complaints are not coming in. So there isn't a restriction saying you can only do it for two weeks a year, it's just you have to go get a permit. But once you have the permit, you can rent it all year long. So we are in fact pulling housing stock potentially off the market we, for short term rentals. We are. and. Um the thing is, it's not the same level um, that is impacting us that they're seeing in South Portland and in Portland. I mean, and, and you know, not to give away the surprises, but <laughs> in the future land use plan, there's actually a recommendation to um, slightly change the permitting for short-term rentals so we can track it better. But it doesn't look like it's a huge growing thing. I, I was just looking at the numbers for a presentation this morning, and we have between like 35 and 60 before we started regulating it. We seem like we're hovering around the 60 number now. Um, I, 
there are some people I know that got into it, decided it was a lot more work than they thought it would be, and they're, they're back out to renting longer term. So, I, I mean, in the interest not of targeting short-term rentals, but trying to make this a little more generic, I have come up with a, an amendment proposed by Councillor Gabrielson. And then it would have a corresponding change in the recommendation. Was this other suggestion? I mean, if you want to, you can, but remember we talked about the recommendations being specific. And it's still subject to restrictions that protect residential landlords. Mm -hmm. What are people's thoughts? I don't know what, why there's really a benefit to keeping it in the recommendations when we seem like we don't really know yet, because it could be just included, as Jeremy said, under other low-impact commercial activities in residential areas. So I would be in favor of striking it. It doesn't preclude us from allowing them, and, and we can go forward and in the future and adopt policies that allow them, regulate them, whatever, but it just seems like a strong statement on something that maybe we don't feel strongly about. Okay. Other thoughts? I guess um, <coughs> the fact we have an ordinance, as Jamie said, that I, I think covers the basis around short-term rental. I, um, I don't have a problem leaving it in. I truly believe that if somebody owns a house, they can choose to hold it off the market and rent it and keep it out of housing stock. I, I just am a firm believer that I own it. I can do with it what I choose to do. And as long as I'm working within the ordinances of the town. So, but you guys can do whatever you like. I'd, I'd also like to point out that um, a lot of the short-term rentals are long-term during the school year. So there are families and people that live in it during the school year, and then during the summer it turns into a short-term rental, or people pay extra during the summer. So not all short-term rentals are short-term all year long that we do have families and people that are living in them during the school year while they're looking for a place to buy or somewhere else to move to. So it isn't just short term um, all year round. I, I just want to point that out. In fact, I lived in one <laughs> when oh, I first moved to Cape. Oh, full it disclosure, was <laughs> good. Full disclosure. Um, and, and my understanding, too, is that there are restrictions on how many people. So you, when you have a short-term rental, it's not like you can have 20 people spending the night. Isn't it eight, um, like a maximum of eight? It, it depends on whether you have a lot that's 30,000 square feet or larger. If you're a 30,000 square foot lot, you're capped at, at eight, and then you're also capped at the number of guests you can have during the day. Um, if you're more than 30,000 square feet, it's basically just two people per bedroom. Jamie, mm -hmm. just, just to follow up on my point and Penny's comment, um, I don't think we need to come out against short-term rentals or put anything in here that says that we don't want them, but it seems like we're not in agreement, and I, I don't know that we need to come out in favor of them. I just want to lawyer that one a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a perhaps or a Okay, should we move on? So just, do you want to go through the goals or are you are you are we just assuming that the committee got it just right? Go ahead, Dolly. I have, I, I, I have another typo, page thirty eight, line um, twenty two. Um, public sewer available on for the northernmost properties. Just um, a, type, a typo there. Also, um, 
My question about the goals, if we are going through each one, uh, number one at line, we're page 42 now, line 30. It's the, the word accommodate, um, strategies to accommodate visitors. Is it only visitors we're accommodating? Um, that was one of my questions. And uh, do we have other economic goals? What about generating revenue? Uh, is tourism a goal? Maybe not, but we seem to have quite a bit of tourism now. Well, and I didn't see tourism the, in the here. The state, if you go through the comprehensive plan rule, they're kind of beating you over the head that you have to keep talking about tourism. So. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's discussed here, and that was kind of why I wanted to go through the goals, because this chapter kind of got blown up about tourism. And um, I missed the specific place that you wanted to talk about. Uh, but the first goal really did talk about tourism. If you think about when this was being written, we were getting a, a lot of complaints from people about traffic. Um, in their neighborhood, especially if their neighborhood had a, um, a lighthouse or two in it. <laughs> so the first goal, um, last comprehensive plan, the first goal talked about the town center, which is the primary commercial area for Cape Elizabeth. And this comprehensive plan talks about the trends, positive negative impacts, and opportunities arise from the rapid increase in tourism. And the town shall develop strategies to accommodate visitors while protecting our parks, open spaces, and neighborhoods. So that was the the big message that the committee pulled out of the economy chapter is um, tourism has uh, its ups and downs. Um, and so this recommendation says basically that the town should be coming up with some kind of study to look at tourism and how it impacts the neighborhoods and figure out how you want to strike the right balance. Um, and then it also says to develop strategies to promote small businesses that serve residents and visitors. And I guess that's my question because I see it as um, we're accommodating visitors. Um, that's one of our goals. But what about generating revenue from our visitors? I, I didn't see that anywhere in here. And I would think that I that. I think, too, the developed strategies to promote small businesses is probably the closest you're going to get to that. Um, if you want to talk about the town generally raising revenue, there might be a better place for that, like the fiscal capacity chapter, mm -hmm. um, or maybe the open space recreation chapter where we discuss Fort Williams, just throwing that out there. Okay, and then um, in goal three, basically it says uh, business A and business B districts shall continue as secondary commercial areas that meet the needs of town residents. I was thinking residents and visitors. Um, well, again, this, this was a negotiation. Um, the original goal was goal one, the town center, goal two, the business districts, goal three, commercial areas, outs, uh, commercial activities outside residential areas. And this got totally restructured by the committee. Uh, what we're trying to remember is if you have a business A district and you have a business B district, there should be something in the comprehensive plan that talks about having those districts because that's your legal underpinning for those districts. So the business A district is explicitly described in our zoning ordinance as being there to serve neighborhood needs. Mm -hmm. the, the town center is the, you know, the big deal downtown. Okay, I was just thinking as a goal though, um, mm -hmm. since it is business A and business B, wouldn't we be serving residents and visitors? Um, if you want that amended, I can change it. <laughs> so uh, that's a huge can of worms. Um, okay. I will, uh, <laughs> as the town planner knows, if, if, if there's one thing that uh, will uh, bring me out of the woodwork is uh, attempts to change the business A district to make it for visitors. Um, I, I'll fight, I'll go. I'll, I'll go going to the mat over the fact that the <laughs> I'm going to go to the mat over <laughs> business A is meant for local residents. Um, basically, if we open it up to, oh, it's targeting visitors, what you're in effect beginning to do is open up, allowing the cookie jar in that region uh, to start building things that are specifically targeted for all the tourists coming up and down Shore Road to Fort Williams, mm -hmm. um, which, um, again, I'm strongly, <laughs> strongly opposed to, as you can imagine, because I live right down the street. Um, and, uh, 
obviously. Well, it's good yeah, just so. to hear yeah. the reasoning yeah. behind it. Um, and I, I appreciate you saying that. I saw that you have a question, but I also just want to jump in and see the opportunity to respond to the, the whole notion of generating revenue is so limited in this capacity. So um, you know, there's, there's almost, you know, short of, you know, fees, for example, that are being discussed for parking at Fort Williams and things like that. I mean, there's, there's almost nothing that we can do to extract additional revenue specifically from visitors. Maybe a handful of businesses open that are targeted towards tourists. Maybe there's a slight um, change to the commercial value of the property that that business occupies, mm -hmm. and they pay a nominal fee for a permit for maybe some service that they provide. But th there's no local sales tax. There's no, you know, there's no hotel tax in, in, in Cape Elizabeth or anything like that. So this idea of somehow getting more from people from away, I think, is just not a reality as much as it would be a great thing if we could do it. Um, so you're talking about a very you know, relatively narrow needle to thread to, to, you know, where there is any opportunity there. So, um, Valerie? I was going to, I had one general comment, which is that I have a, a couple comments about goals one and two. And I was going to ask if maybe we could just go through, like, starting with goal one and I'll talk about it and sure. move on. Um, so, I had some, a proposal for actually just rewording goal one. I, would propose striking the first sentence of that goal, which is more a recommendation to meet the goal, in my opinion, than at the actual goal. So it would read, the town shall develop strategies to accommodate, I changed visitors to tourism while protecting the interests of residents, I added, comma, our parks, comma, open spaces and neighborhoods. Um, and then going down to the recommendations, um, I would add, so I would separate recommendation one into first recommendation, evaluate trends, impacts, etc., and then a period after Cape Elizabeth, and with the second recommendation would be develop strategies to preserve both the town's character and historic relationship with tourism, and then the third goal being what's currently the second one. I support all those changes. I like that. Changes. Yes. I think it's good. This sounds really good. I'm taking my writing. <laughs> I know. I know. This one. Did you have to work magic on gold too, too? I've got a recommendation. Is that it? Yeah, that's all I have for, for that first one. I didn't know okay. if other people had comments. Sounds like there's general consensus on that. That's good. Um, so for the second one, um, I didn't change the wording of the goal, but I thought we might want to consider possibly changing it. I did think that we should add a recommendation under the second one that echoes a little bit the recommendation under the first, but more with an eye towards the residents, as Councillor Devereaux was pointing out. Um, so adding a recommendation that says develop strategies to start and promote businesses, I didn't put small businesses, um, that serve the needs of residents. The reason I didn't put small businesses is because I think that that's pretty much covered by the town center master plan, mm -hmm. what type of business we want, but I think we could discuss what, what we would want there. Mm -hmm. right out? It's really less clear. But essentially, um, we could be oh. echoing this just that serve um, the needs of residents. So, if I could comment on that, mm -hmm. I, I can tell you that, and I'm looking at 
this was discussed at the committee level and um, obviously anything you want is going to go in there but the comment that and, and in particular there were even specific properties that were discussed as properties that should be developed and I would just caution the council that this kind of recommendation is the kind of thing that is implemented by an economic development director which you don't have and you know there hasn't been a lot of support for any kind of development in the town so just just to know that if you say you want to do something like this it's it is a policy shift i think what people often conflate though is the notion of having um, a viable and even vibrant town center that has storefronts filled existing properties developed and things like that versus what the point i was you know discussing with Councilor Deborah a minute ago about what revenue the town actually derives from that so i and, and i think i think oftentimes those things get confused um or or blurred at the very least um so um the latter would involve as you said a much more comprehensive effort to attract the types of businesses or large-scale commercial development like you see in some of the surrounding communities that are even comparative communities that we're benchmarking ourselves against a route one retail corridor in falmouth or a massive utility like you have uh, still existing in yarmouth or you know even over in westbrook uh, where there's you know more um, commercial development with some large-scale employers i think that is a very separate scenario than the notion that I think what Councilor Randall that you're getting to is just promoting the a, a sense of downtown and, and and openness for business, if you will. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, I was looking at the the figure on page 36, figure 11, I think it is, and 60 percent of respondents support new commercial development. Yes. This isn't necessarily new commercial development. I think in a, it's not like we're proposing, you know, massive structures, but the, um, the town center master plan, like Jamie just noted, does call for this vibrant main street area. And so just with an eye towards that promoting, we could put small businesses that serve the needs of residents but I think that was what was important when I made that edit to myself, is serving the needs of residents to distinguish it from, because we're, we're in the other section, starting and promoting small businesses that serve residents and visitors, but I think it's also important to have one that is just about serving the needs of residents specifically, yes. like, you know, more um, things like the IGA where you can actually get something that is a, a need so for people who may not be able to travel outside of the town, they can get it right here. I, I agree and I think that um, creating the town center is something that a lot of people have talked about and would like to see happen and it doesn't have to be some big box corporation coming in, but small businesses. I think that's a great idea um, to add that in here. So in terms of specific changes that you're recommending? Yeah, I would recommend another recommendation that basically echoes the one under the goal one, but just removes the part about visitors and specifically states serve the needs of residents. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else on that? I, I would like to point out mm -hmm. that uh, one of the strategies that's used in the comprehensive plan is not to restate everything that's already been done. So this is a good example of why uh, we have a town center plan that's been adopted by the council and it was just incorporated into this document by reference. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that happen over and over again. Okay. 
Anything else on these goals and recommendations in the economy section? More a question yep. than, a, than a comment. Um, so, thinking about the economy, uh, you know, local economy, the number of commuters that we have, and, and employment is something that comes up pretty regularly. Um, I just wanted to know that there is a specific recommendation in the transportation chapter um, for exploring increased transit options. Yes. Um, but recognizing the overlap just seemed like that was a. Uh, Something that also could have been addressed here in the, in the town center plan. I just wanted to note that that is coming up in another chapter. In a um, minute. In a minute. Um, and I also wanted to ask, given the discussion we had teeing this off around um, telecommuting, um, if there was any um, – there's not a specific recommendation in here around – broadband, cellular connectivity. There is. In, in this chapter. Not in this chapter. And, 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 and Councillor Jordan can agree that um, the committee was uh, very industrious in coming up with lots of recommendations, and we had uh, well over 100. And then they had to go through the, an effort of pairing it back because there was a lot of duplications. There was, I think one recommendation was made four different ways in four different chapters. So uh, this is part of that whole pick one place and say it once and say it well. And the wireless was, um, it landed, it has a home now and, and, and we, we're gonna try to, you know, stick with not repeating these things. But you're absolutely right. Uh, wireless was a big, big deal. Thank you. Anything else on economy? Okay. Transportation chapter. So that starts on page 44. Um, just a couple of highlights from that. Uh, traffic volumes are going down based on the state data. 70% um, of people who work in Cape Elizabeth come from someplace else. And under the heading of it overlaps, we need to talk about housing. Uh, sidewalks was a big issue with all of the public participation efforts. This is the chapter where we do the most discussion about sidewalks, so if you care about that, this is the place. Uh, we recognize that Cape Elizabeth is a peninsula, so it's really destination traffic we're dealing with. It's not a pass-through community like a Scarborough or a Freeport. Uh, we have a complete streets policy that the council has adopted, and that is recognized in this report. Um, and we do talk about tourism traffic in this section. However, we just went over the whole idea of tourism and its impacts on the town in the economy chapter. So um, I'd like to stop at that point and, and go with questions. I, I have a question about uh, roadway traffic on page 52. I noticed that it doesn't uh, mention anything about um, bus traffic from cruise ships. Um, the bus traffic would not have been pulled out. It just would have been traffic. Okay, so you're not, um, you're just calling it traffic. Are you talking about traffic counts, roadway traffic? Roadway traffic. Yeah, traffic the, those would have been any. Not the nature Those of counts the would have been based on any vehicle, whether it's a bus or a car. Well, I, it was just curious to me because it says that it's declined from 2002 to 2016. Um, however, I think we've had an increase in quite a bit of the traffic, especially with tourism, buses, trolleys. Uh, in the last three years, maybe four? These numbers are coming from the state and you know how they light, lay those big black cables across the road and they periodically collect data and then the rest of the time they do calculations. And this is the data we have from the state. Um, you know, if the town had done its own traffic count, we could recognize that as, you know, local information. Okay, it just seems that it's not quite, it doesn't quite tell the, the entire story. Is there a way that we can make a footnote or add something that says that it may not be completely accurate with? Um, so based? on page 56. I think the, the challenge is what we're hearing is that the 
the methodology for survey is around an aggregate number of vehicles, not vehicle type, not the nature of the trip, et cetera, et cetera. Chris? I just note that um, in the last year, the town actually did do traffic volume studies on a number of roads, including Shore Road. Um, so we do have some of that data that could be incorporated here. For volume, not for type. Correct. Uh, so I'm um, I'm jumping to the table of selected traffic volumes in Cape Elizabeth is to tie it in. So yes, not necessarily type, but the actual volume. So yeah. what I would suggest is if you think of this chapter as the front part being the data we got from the state that puts Cape Elizabeth in context with the rest of the state, and then think of the back part of the chapter is more of the local detail on page 56 we have a discussion about tourism, and we could, in, we could augment that particular paragraph with additional information on whatever traffic data is available. Is that something you think might meet the need? It says it was... Um has resulted in increased traffic due to tourism. We and also the response from the community. Yeah. Are we are we on page fifty six? Fifty six. Yes. So, but if if there, I don't. I'm not aware of any. I mean, when we when we were putting this report together, we were constantly talking to departments and asking for information. So, I don't have any new information. But if there's something that's happened that you want me to add that relates to traffic for Fort Williams, I could put it in this tourism section. That's what I'm suggesting. So it, we don't have to find a way to work those those numbers into the state data, which I don't know how that would ever happen. Yeah. Right. I think that's a, what I'm saying is I think the challenge is we don't have an actual data source that supports the anecdotal claim that you're stating, and I'm not saying we don't agree with, but. Um, well, but we do. Um, if you think about um, our Fort Williams committee, and they have tracked just buses alone that come in. One day we had 77. So they they do. Right, but they we, have been tracking. But you can't you can't leap to make the assumption that there's all this other volume of traffic happening plus that. So again, if you go back to the if you go back to the table that's specifically on page 53 about the traffic volume, so those are raw vehicle counts. Those are raw trip counts, right? Correct. It, However, so it only goes up to 2016. No, but regard, I'm, I'm talking about the type of information being supplied, mm -hmm. right? So we can't necessarily just extrapolate on our own that because there's more buses and cars at Fort Williams, as an example, that, well, there's all these people that are still making their regular trips plus that traffic. Does that make sense? I, I think the way the committee's handled it with a pretty specific call out to not only the nature of the problem, but the reaction of the community in both these paragraphs, both, frankly, both around traffic calming, which is not necessarily related to tourism, but it's something that we hear quite a bit about frequently. And then the, the part about tourism and the impact that that's having on parking and road usage and things like that. I mean, I, I, think, I think that's as appropriately, as appropriate as we can address it here without having an actual data point to support what we all think is happening, but we just there's no actual number that shows that. If, if I may, yep. to um, just relating back to the discussion we had earlier on demographics and relating the data to mm -hmm. specific actions, I think the types of analyses and actions that you're talking about are, are pretty well covered under recommendation number 12, um, which starts on line 16 of page 58. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, we certainly could add more detail to the discussion, but I think the I think the the discussion that's in here gets us to the recommendation that I'd like to see us getting to. Okay, and that's where I was headed. If if, if it says here that traffic's declining, how do we make a recommendation that we need to de develop methods to protect tranquility? So I guess that's where I what I'm looking at because it referenced it in tourism. This is where the, the impact uh, is being felt, which is, to your point, you're going, mm -hmm. there, there appears to be increased traffic as a result of tourism. And so without specific numbers, we go to 
uh, we need to understand this better because we know that it's happening. We know there's impact. So how do we um, how do we assess the the full impact of all of those cars coming in on Shore Road and coming out of the fort, taking a left versus a right? Mm -hmm. And we talked a lot about the left-hand turn to the center of town, across to uh, Two Lights and Lobster Shack and all of those other places. And we need to look at how we're going to handle that. Exactly. Uh, that's what that, to Jeremy's point, that's what that recommendation is about. How do we want to handle it? Right. So it's acknowledged, uh, but there's no specific numbers we put beside it. Okay. Matt, if it'd be helpful, yeah. Mr. Chairman, uh, we did have the study done by BHB back in 2017 that actually showed the daily traffic counts on Shore Road at about 35.65 and 34.35 uh, from our traffic study that was done that would kind of show that it had stayed about the same or grew some on average uh, from what the data from the state that was provided. So, I mean, if we wanted to tweak that number to reflect that, that may not be a bad opportunity to do that so I think it is that confirms the anecdotal thoughts that, of, of yeah I, I would and just and take those numbers for. and put them in separately yeah. you yeah. Know, again uh, just, my, my point is not around the aggregate volume of traffic because yeah. that we can use multiple different data sources mm -hmm. to cite and describe that what I'm just saying is that I, I, what I'm not comfortable with is anecdotally ascribing a data point to something that we don't actually have the information for, and that's the type of vehicle traffic, whether it's yeah, a bus, whether it's a trolley, whether it's a car without a state place, which equals tourism. We don't know any of that but from any of our data sources. True. That's all. No, that's true, but I don't think that's what we're talking about doing. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I mean, to a degree it is when you're, you, you, we originally started this out with your question on page 52 around how come there's no reference to tourism there in the roadway traffic. Right. Well, it yeah. says that it's declined that that um, volumes have declined over the past 15 years, and my point was, um, how has it declined when we have so much more traffic, especially the tourism? And I'm not saying we need to. Uh, maybe right. I wasn't clear. We don't need to delineate it out. I'm just saying that that doesn't make sense to me, since we can say in the last four years, we have a huge increase in tourism, mm -hmm. right. so yeah. our traffic must have gone up. And, and I think, you know, the aggregate vehicle miles traveled uh, annually um, has been declining slowly mm -hmm. um, for several years now, um, related to a, a number of trends, not least of which in town would be an aging population. Um, doesn't mean that individual places aren't going to see increased traffic volumes at certain times of year or at certain times of day, but overall across our system, you know, that finding is pretty in line with, with statewide and national trends on vehicle miles travel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other points folks want to make on transportation? I, I do have a specific question that I'm curious about. Um, Recommendation number 17 on page 58, obviously we hear a lot from people a lot of times, as you do as well, Maureen, around our favorite intersection in town. <laughs> um, can you enlighten me on the committee's discussion here and, and what led to this specific recommendation? So which one are we talking about? <laughs> number 17, line 38, number page one, The one where okay. we need to put a roundabout. Yes. <laughs> Well, you know, I work with the committee that this council created, and this is what they came up with. They they discussed the the intersection again, and to be fair, um, I reviewed with the committee the number of times that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council has considered and rejected changes to that intersection, and act, and I think we're at three or four times now. Um, the last time a $749,000 grant was returned. So this was their recommendation that we should prioritize traffic calming measures instead of redesign of the intersection. I think part Please. of that converts only because I get to see it every single day. So do I. Um, anyway, I think part of that conversation had to do with 
um, rerouting traffic could be done. It wasn't a redesign of the intersection, but there are things that can be done from a traffic perspective to alleviate the uh, congestion in that area and the high percentage of accidents that happen or seems to happen. Is so, the data, is that data accurate around? Accident data? Well, it's, it's, it's back on. I yeah, see one. It, it fell off the high crash location list, and now it's back on the high crash location list. But, but I, I just have to put this in context. I, I was at a meeting where we were looking at uh, high crash accident locate intersections for the region, and you know, if you have a critical rate factor of over one, then you are potentially a high crash location, and the state's willing to take a look. If you look at the list of high crash locations just in Portland, South Portland, and Cape Elizabeth, you know, we're we're right at the bottom. They, there are there are intersections out there with a, a CRF of of 18. So. You know, just made it on, and my guess is that it'll probably slip off again. It's, it's, you know, I, right there on the edge. I don't mean to be argumentative, no, but I'm going to be, um, <laughs> because I seriously watch this intersection every single day, multiple times, because I look out over it from where I live. Um, and uh, there is the opportunity for at least in the morning during school transportation time for at least four or five accidents because of the way people have determined that the traffic pattern should flow. And I, I would assume that there is more than one accident either a week or every two weeks. There has to be, it's crazy. Hmm. It is probably one of the most dangerous intersections I've seen. Now probably when school is out of session, we won't have that, which will be that dip. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have to tell you, that is an intersection that needs, needs a lot of uh, work from my perspective. And didn't you have an accident there? <laughs> I didn't push it over the, the boundary from being a high class location to being one, but I may have contributed to it. I, I think it's, it, it was one of the ones when we were in, the, in our meetings that I just go, that is, it's a really bad intersection. And then you overlay kids crossing the streets out of the crosswalks and everything else that's going on there. So uh, traffic patterns that can change. I know most people take a right out of uh, Cumbies to go up onto Scott Dyer Road because that's the safest way to do it. So anyway. One thing out of this that I think we need to re-examine and so it doesn't fall directly into the comp plan, but I do think we should go back and um, put some um, firmer and more modern and more technology-driven solutions into our traffic calming policy and work with the um, chief of police and uh, others on that because if you look through the traffic calming policy, which is referenced here, um, it's pretty pretty passive, mm -hmm. um, and there's, a, I think, a lot more that we can do and that you see in other communities um, with much, you know, what much bolder traffic calming things that can be done than what we're doing. So, I agree. Um, whether the intersection itself ultimately changes, I think will continue to be a matter of great debate, but um, yeah. I think there's probably a lot more that we can do, both on that stretch and then in, in ultimately in some other areas of town, too. So. So maybe we need to make this statement a little stronger. Do you think it meets what you're suggesting, Jamie? Well, what I would probably say is up on number 11, it says continue administration of the traffic calming policy. Um, uh, maybe it's something, a something to the effect of, you know, update as appropriate and continue the administration or, or something like that. Um, up, you know, update to reflect um, current yeah. current technologies and methods, yeah. and then continue the administration. I, I agree. I think we need something much stronger, like you said, update or um, send it to committee. So, something, because one of the other things that I don't know that anyone's looked at is um, 
uh, with the high school, a lot of that traffic in the morning is due to high school students and parents taking kids to school. And there are ways, kids do have periods three, so there are ways that the school could give seniors first period free. It would also give them time to sleep in, but there's ways they could do that to where there's not as many kids on the road during first and second period, which would be the 7.30 in the morning, um, eight o'clock. And I think that if this study is implemented or um, reevaluated, to do that also with the school and talk about how they are um, assigning kids to classes. So I know that a couple days a week my daughter doesn't have first period and there's other kids that don't so they're not driving in. It would also, I think, relieve some of the congestion in the high school parking lot if they're not all getting there at the same time. So just a suggestion that it might be something they haven't looked at yet for the traffic calming. So you want to do something different than what it says? Um, well, what I'm suggesting on 11, if you go further up. Yep, I got 11 done, yeah. I think. Okay. But I, I mean, this is an, this is an important recommendation. This is what? This, the, that intersection is, yes. you know, it's a lightning rod for stuff. Yep. So, you know, if you, if as a committee, if you can give me a consensus of what you're interested in, I can redraft something and bring it back. Um, let's see. Maybe instead of prioritize traffic calming measures, I'll get a few you want to study it? Um, I was going to say. Um, something to the effect of implement more aggressive traffic calming policies. Yeah, that's kind of, and I'm going to use the word progressive, but I shouldn't use that word. Um, it, and it's not innovative, but it's more along your technology lines. It's mm -hmm. like leveraging new technologies, prioritize the use of new technologies in order to address um, traffic challenges in the town center around 77 Shore Road and Scott Dye Road, something along those lines. I guess if, if I were to wait, there's essentially there's, there's multiple things, but there's three big buckets that we can, we can draw on. Only three? Three big, I, I'll, I can think of three. Oh. <laughs> um, there's traffic calming, there's demand management, and there's a redesign of the intersection. Right. Um, I, I don't personally have a strong opinion as to, I, I, I'm not ready to rule any of those options off the table. Mm -hmm. um, so I think where I'm at at this point on this intersection is that we should be looking at evaluating that mix of those three big options and trying to find a way to you know, our goal should be to, um, at, at the very least, get it off the high drive location <laughs> list, um, but to improve the functionality of the intersection. And I think, you know, I, I don't know what the right mix is of demand management you mm -hmm. know, to new technologies for traffic calming or other intersection improvements, but it's going to be some mix of those three things. Well, and I think in the three buckets right. you're describing, you need to exhaust the first one. Yes. Before even so, then it's you know, progressively. Yeah. Progressive. Well, I mean, you can you can walk and chew gum at the same time on some of them, but <laughs> I mean, I, I think that without having fully exhausted the first one, to the extent that you feel like we've we've taken all the tools out of our toolkit and applied them here, then the other two are kind of I don't know next level adjustments, yes. if you will. If we can get um, it done with traffic calming yeah. and diverting traffic right. through. You know, schedule changes and things like that. Great. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think you've got the gist of it, though, Maureen. Cool. Um, and understand the point that we're describing here if you want to finesse it more. Okay. I, Jeremy. Um, so, first of all, if you hadn't guessed already, I'm a little bit of a transportation planning geek. Um, 
And I just want to commend the committee um, on putting together a great list of goals and actions um, for this chapter. Um, I, unfortunately, they're, they're not here, but hopefully they'll be watching. Um, and I I'm particularly like the um, recommendations around sidewalks and around complete streets. Um, one additional question that I would raise um, or concern that I have is around uh, some safety issues that I perceive as a user, um, as a bicyclist, um, not town-wide, but in specific places that are not likely to be subject to our complete streets policy anytime soon. Um, and I'm specifically thinking of um, Shore Road and section a section of Spurwake from roughly from Wells Road up to um, 77, where it, it just feels less safe on your bike than a lot of other places in town. Um, and so I would, um, I'd like to see, I, I don't think it has to be a heavy lift, but I'd like to see something in here that would position us to um, look at, evaluate options for uh, enhancing, uh, it could be minor reroutes, it could be minor tweaks of the roadway, but something to enhance um, safety of bicyclists and motorists sharing those road, narrower roadway, narrower high traffic volume roadways. Um, I think it's more of a study and looking at what the options are than a, like a full build out, but um, those are some, that's one additional item I would add to the list. Does it have those shoulder issues on those roadways? They have shoulder issues, they're tight, they're tight roadways, so there's not, you know, there's not a ton that you can do, but um, I think there there's a couple of spots in particular um, mm -hmm. that are really narrow where either some signage or possibly, um, you know, just minor roadway striping realignments could, could make a difference. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. So develop a specific recommendation to include, or? Um, I, think, I think Maureen's getting pretty close. I, I think what I would suggest is, um, I, you know, I, I don't, Mr. Yeah. what I was going to, if you're willing to send me a list of your specific ideas, I could add that into the text. I, yeah, I can do that. And I, I think it's, you know, I, I just, I see a huge volume of, of bicyclists who come through and do the mm -hmm. lighthouse loop, essentially. Um, and really, if all we did was just look at what our options are to enhance bicycle safety, safe safety for bicyclists on shore road, that gets us 90% of the way there. Um, but I think we should at least take a look at that. Mm -hmm. See what our options are. I know we have a good resource in town, too, who active on the Conservation Committee, mm -hmm. who um, works with the Bicycle Coalition of Maine, too. There's probably some best practices and recommendations Absolutely. and things that they work with with towns and communities we can probably leverage there as well. So, okay. I have one more. Um, under uh, number two, I was thinking also about bike paths, but what about um, promoting, uh, we talk about climate change and sea level rise, what about clean air, ride sharing, biking, um, what about an electric charging station? I know that the state is giving money to um, municipalities for charging stations and South Portland has a couple. What about a charging station or um, some way to promote clean vehicles? Is that something we want to do? I actually was going to say something very similar on a similar note. I don't know where this fits or how whether it fits in of the comprehensive plan, if it's something that could come in under the complete streets. But um, living near the schools, it astounds me every day to see the number of cars driving in with yes. one parent and one child. Yes. And it's such a small town. Um, it seems like something that we should prioritize, especially because we do sort of, I mean, there's a mention in this about climate change and sea level rise, although I think that maybe goes more to um, the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But it seems like something we should be addressing somehow, whether it's promoting use of these school buses or like you said ride sharing or something like that. 
but that would go a long way to addressing some of the traffic concerns that we have as well with that intersection in the mornings. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's not, a, I know that some cities um, have weeks that, you know, this is rideshare week, like we had plogging week. They could do something like that even where you're promoting ride sharing or, or I've seen a lot of parents riding bikes with their kids to elementary, to elementary school now, uh, which is really cool to see them riding bikes with the kids in the morning. Maybe there's some way to um, promote bike to school day or something to get people um, thinking about clean air. And Today actually was National Bike to School Day, Bike to Walk to School Day, I think was well, well um, promoted and well participated in um, actually at the schools today. But um, I'm just, I, I'm not disagreeing with the sentiment. I, I'm re reminded by, you know, Maureen's point at the beginning of the discussion tonight about recommendations being specific and measurable and things like that. So I just, if we're, if we're going to be adding in recommendations such as that, I just mm -hmm. want to make sure that, um, and I, I think the other point I would say though is that overall, um, and it's partly just how the chapters break down. I mean, I have, I have an overall comment that I don't think that the plan is aggressive enough around some things related to sustainability. But, um, and I think part of that is based on just how the sections and chapters chunk out. But um, it's not a criticism of the work of the committee by any stretch, but just structurally, I think it, um, I don't know that the plan allows us, the plan as drafted allows us to be as aggressive as I would maybe hope or want us to be in that area, so. Yeah, that's what I was kind of wondering, like how or whether that would even fit here. But it seems like if we can put it in, maybe we should consider putting something in that's a little stronger on conservation and sustainability. So the, the reason this is in here is if you go back a few pages, there is the, uh, the town's vulnerability assessment and um, the comprehensive plan committee actually took a lot of attention of that, which was kind of nice since they worked on it and didn't really get a lot of attention otherwise. Um, and there was a member of the committee who was who really was pushing this whole idea that if you look at page 57, the chart shows there's a bunch of town roads, well not a bunch, but there's a significant number of town roads that are in um, either immediate or likely chance of inundation. And um, you know, since this was written, the town has uh, started on the Sawyer Road study that you're all aware of, where you know that's the road that's probably inundated the most frequently in the town, and that's being addressed. So, yes, there is this issue with climate change, and it was one of those issues that didn't fit well in any one chapter. Um, we did talk about doing a whole sustainability chapter, and the discussion, the decision in the end was. It might be more effective to incorporate it into the chapters rather than put it in its own place where it was easily ignored. Other thoughts? <coughs> um, the only other point I'll make about EV charging units is um, I'm, I'm all for doing it, um, and as I think I shared in an email with you guys, there's some grants um, going around that we might have an opportunity to pursue and all that kind of stuff. Um, as it relates to the economy and job section, there aren't that many people that are, you know, sort of coming here for work or for other reason. So I'm sure that there'd be usage of them, but not in the same way that you see at other communities where there's reserved spots because there's people coming there from somewhere else that have taken a, a journey. You know, I don't, I don't know how many EVs we'd have. The, you know, the only major parking that we have in town, for example, would either be at Fort Williams or um, at the at the schools. Um, so, anyway, for what it, for there, there aren't. Sort of people commuting within town to then, <coughs> excuse me, have a necessity to then charge. Most of those people that have those types of vehicles are charging them at their at their house. Again, I'm not opposed to and a strong advocate for having them, um, but as a 
as a function of behavioral change. I'm not, I'm not sure what it would do other than be just a positive statement that the community is making. But, um, does, is, is there a specific recommendation that anybody wants to put on the table or? I've Oh. Well, I keep looking, I'm routine. trying to manage the room here, and I, I, you're I'm doing sorry. all this stuff behind me that I can't. I need That's a mirror. That's what I'm doing. Here. I'm sneaking it in. <laughs> I need so a mirror um, I just added to okay. recommendation 18. I think that seemed like here: climate change, sea level rise, and expansion of electric car charging infrastructure. Okay, we're starting to run a little bit significantly behind schedule here. Um, I was going to suggest, and council are getting. Up. Does anybody need a break for a minute, or we should just plow ahead? I'm good. Okay. Um, anything else on transportation before we move on? Okay, we'll go to housing and see what we can do to make up some time. Okay, and, and I promise that we'll get easier. Mm -hmm. uh, so 90% of housing in Cape Elizabeth is single family homes. 75% uh, of housing in Cape Elizabeth is owner occupied. Uh, if there is one issue you wanna take away from the housing chapter is that Cape Elizabeth has a huge affordability problem. Um, the, we've got a number in here for the medium price to buy a home. You go a couple of chapters on. The assessor has put it at 498,000. So basically, um, think about how many young families with little children can afford half a million dollars to buy a house. Um, from 2000 to 2015, we built 364 new homes. Um, again, going back to the affordable housing problem, uh, the way it's calculated that the median income family can only afford 63% of the median income, the median priced home. So there's a big disconnect there. Uh, we're predicting 12 homes a year. We're predicting fewer homes than the state is estimating because they use a top-down model. Uh, we did a cool little condo survey, and the reason we did that is there's been a real, there were some people in the committee that really pushed back on the effort to expand multifamily housing that was in the last comprehensive plan. Uh, one of the reasons we talked about expanding multifamily housing was because we said we have this huge um, growing elderly population, and if they're um, relatively healthy, but they don't want to live in their single family home anymore, they don't really have any other choices other than to leave Cape Elizabeth. A lot of them have lived here their whole lives. So the question was, well, how many of those people are actually moving into these condos? We sent, um, we did our own little mini survey. We sent it to 359 condo owners in Cape Elizabeth. We had a really good response rate. And uh, we found that about 40% of the people that are living in Cape Elizabeth condos were living in Cape Elizabeth before they bought their condo. Um, so one, uh, increasing the supply of condos is helping the seniors. Two, why isn't it more than 40%? So, you know, why do we, that, and that gets back really to the affordability. Um, and, and I don't have huge data on that. So that's kind of the, the housing chapter. Um, in a nutshell, I can go over the, um, the state requires that the town have an affordability strategy, and you do. You have existing regulations um, that require that affordable housing be included in new development. I think we're up to 16 affordable homes. So this, the strategy is, in my opinion, successful in that it's creating permanent new affordable housing. It's successful in that we can point to it when the state says, how are you addressing their goal? It's not successful in that we're just not creating enough. And that particular strategy relies on new development. And when you have a very small amount of new development, you're gonna have an even smaller amount of new affordable housing. So there was some discussions about the town um, being a bigger player in the affordable housing game, uh, putting some money, and um, that uh, did not get majority support from the committee. So that's not a recommendation in this plan. Yes. I have a question to start off. Um, mm -hmm. Recommendation 25, um, which is line 26 on page 76, um, says to consider amendments to allow cottage housing development. I may have missed it. I didn't see that term defined previously. No, it wasn't defined, but what is it was. Cottage housing? Well, 
Um, I'm happy to provide you with the, the flyer. There was a lot of interest in trying to come up with some creative things to do. Cottage housing basically is really small single family homes on really small lots um, surrounding a little tiny green. And um, it was an informational proposal and it, it made it in here to the recommendation. It's just, I'm happy to add a cottage housing definition into, into the chapter if you would like that or maybe look do something else with that recommendation. I think at the very least better contextualizing it is probably useful if it's to stay in, so. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. I think adding a definition is a good idea. It sounds like an interesting concept. Um, and, and any other specific comments or questions on that? I have a couple other things, but um, can you clarify for me? At page 62, there's two charts that show Cape Elizabeth age of housing. This is the age of the unit, right? And the tenure associated with the housing unit. Yeah, that's the okay. that's the year the housing yeah. was built, and, so, and for some places it's important. For Cape, we're doing pretty well. Yeah. So I don't think I, I may have overlooked it, but I don't think I did. We don't have any data point in here that references the tenure of the occupant at all, do we? No. Is that available? I can find out. And the reason I ask is because I think it goes back to some of the points we were discussing earlier with population and demographics around predictability of housing turnover. So if we had, and, and frankly might better feed some of the recommendations in here around type of housing stock to consider promoting, because if we've got you know, a whole large group or quartile of um, housing that's, you know, people that have been in it for 40 years or whatever, we can reasonably expect that those people might be moving on from that house in the relative near future. I, I, um, I don't, I could be wrong, I don't, I, I believe at the census block level they have, um, you can query whether the homeowner has been in the community for five years or more. Um, or less than that, I don't believe you can pull out the length of tenure in, in the individual house. But we would, I mean, would we have our own I, I, first party I, data on that, though? If, if I may, yeah. um, what I used to find in my, uh, in my previous yeah. life was that approximately about 10% of the housing units would turn over in the course of a year. Okay. So roughly about three, 375 to 400 homes per year would sell in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, but if one was to go through and look at that, you could look at data transfer. I think you could extract it, mm -hmm. uh, ultimately. I mean, I, there's, mm -hmm. there's stuff that we could pull out specific uh, from the, the assessor's database that you could look at when the last transfer happened, and then look at data sale, and then you could go back, and there's some. And you'd probably have to weed out. I mean, I know yeah. there's a lot of transfers that are like, oh, it's going to a trust and all that kind of stuff, and so the people haven't actually moved. That's, that's very that. cleanable, though. Yeah, so, um, but anyway, I, that's something I'd be very curious about because I think it would be a very telling statistic around, um, you know, what for I've been saying for a long time as an anecdotal thing in my neighborhood is, you know, a whole bunch of empty nesters that are sitting on large homes that are going to turn over in the next and decade. I, and probably. I think rather than going back and rewriting the chapter mm -hmm. at this point, what I would suggest is possibly adding that as a recommendation that we should be trying to, I, I, what I'd like to, I, I'd like to get See if we can answer that question. Right. Get okay. more into the business of predictability and forecast versus the business of yeah. watching historical trends. Mm -hmm. if, if I may, Mr. Yep. One, one other thing that was, was really interesting when I first started here was when Piper Shores opened up. And you saw, uh, you could see a whole generational transfer that yes. took place uh, right around the time I did my first revaluation in town because uh, the northern part of town had a, a large turnover uh, at, that, at that point That's in time with a lot of older people. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was interesting how, how a single point source could, could impact a market like that and impact a town where you had a, just that, that, that generational change that happened. So, that was, uh, but, but I think, you know, when Clint, 
Clint will be back on Monday, and uh, I can reach out to him and have him you know, start to work on that because it's something that I would look at on occasion as well. So I think we can kind of get a rough, rough number out of there. Okay. Councilor Garvin, yep. in the public opinion survey that was done for the 2007 comprehensive plan, we did ask that question. How long and the answer been? was that people were hanging out here more than 20 years. It was, it, I remember a consultant at the time said, this is a long time for people to stay in the same town. And I think it's gotten longer. We, we didn't choose to ask that question this time. Every time you put the survey together, you're trying to keep it to a certain length, and that one fell off the table. Mm -hmm. But well, I, I think we could find the information again through attacking in a different way number one but I and I would be surprised if I would be very surprised if that tenure hasn't gotten longer than from that 2007 people are very satisfied yeah. they tend to stay I, I think that I think that monitoring that trend is important though because Falmouth is one of our peer communities and they had historically always had a very long housing tenure as well but speaking with their um, uh, some of the, one of their councilmen recently, They've seen a huge transition recently. In, in recent years, uh, accredited to a variety of sources where their, their average home ownership tenure has come down dramatically. Mm -hmm. And that has a lot of implications for how the community functions. So I think it's something to just kind of it'd be good to keep on top of that. Um. Other questions that people have on housing? I have another couple, but go ahead. Oh, I just, on number 28, uh, I was at one of the um, study sessions that we had, and this was something that came up that a lot of people were very positive about, that they thought this was something we should do, is look at um, the non-conforming lots, being able to build on non-conforming lots. The word evaluate just seems, doesn't seem, um, aggressive enough or strong enough? Uh, what are your thoughts? It just seems like it's something that I'd like to see us okay. So um, uh, 24 and 28 are examples of deal breakers for me where I will vote against any comprehensive plan that has these in here. Uh, to give you an example of why, uh, my lot is 22,000 odd square feet. Mm -hmm. What 28 would allow me to do, especially if it dropped down to the 7,500 number, I could chop my lot up and put two new houses on that lot. So anyone that's familiar with my lot, imagine how that would impact my neighborhood if I built two new houses on my lot. It would, in my opinion, destroy the character of the neighborhood. So people, these lot restrictions have been there for decades, from my, as near as I can tell. What this proposes is basically providing people an economic windfall where they bought the lot with expect, certain economic expectations, which are reasonable, and suddenly we're gonna create the situation where just because you have the lot at this moment in time, haha, -ha, you're now going to make a couple hundred grand by being able to carve it up and have these in. So it, it's basically an economic windfall for people at the expense of, I think, uh, significantly harming the, the neighborhood. So I'm, I'm strongly opposed to 28. Uh, 24 also has the exact same effect. There's these large single family homes, rather than allowing people to carve them into pieces and turn them into little units, they just need to turn over so that people that are looking for the larger homes with more bedrooms can actually get their hands on them. So, Go ahead. I, if I may just follow number 28, when, when we were at the, uh, the meeting that we had, the way it was described to us is that throughout the, ten, like years ago, um, houses were built maybe on a 5,000 square foot lot or a 7,500 square foot lot. And um, maybe a few houses were put in and there was a lot here or there that didn't get built. And then the restrictions over the years changed to where it had to be 10,000. Uh, and so there's still some of those little lots that are in neighborhoods that are 7,500 and the other houses built on them are on 7,500 square foot lots. So it would be conforming. It wouldn't be to where anyone could change their lot size. It would be one of these little lots that's already in an established neighborhood on houses with houses on the same size lot to where you could go ahead and build a house that, kind of, that fits in with the character of the other houses. That's what I'm talking about, and I thought that sounded reasonable. So uh, to, to 
directly address that point. So my lot is when uh, the Mountain View Park subdivision was laid out, it was two lots. Someone bought both of the lots and treated them as one. So it's this situation you're describing where it was as laid out, two lots, but it was then developed as one. There's like, there's a number of other lots in Mountain View Park that have the same situation where someone went in and they bought two lots um, and they've always been treated as one for over a hundred years. Um, so yes, my lot is twice the size of many of the surrounding lots and the people across the street from me are on much smaller lots. Yes, if I filled it in by building one or two additional houses, the lots of all of those combined is going to be roughly the size of my neighbors, but it would have a significant impact on the surrounding community. So, and it basically would provide people in the situation like me with an economic windfall that isn't really justified at the expense of the neighbors. Maybe the neighbors wouldn't mind if there were two additional buildings there, but I have a feeling there'd be. So I view this as a highly controversial provision that would have significant blowback once people realize it's at play and once someone begins actually doing this in some of these communities, but I could be wrong. I want to ask Maureen to jump in here before we go yeah. further down the debate here because um, I was at the same meeting that Valerie was at yeah. and I was equally intrigued by this and from my reading of page 73, which precedes the recommendations, I, I, I thought the opportunity here was much more narrowly tailored and narrowly defined than the, the admitted concern that I would share with Chris if it wasn't. So can you just talk about this in a little bit more detail about infill lots? And Because sure. I, as I understood them and the paragraph that starts at 17 and goes through 26 appears to describe what are effectively, I hate to use the term, but kind of orphaned lots versus somebody taking Chris's example where there's an already established dwelling on it and I'm guessing that your lot has even been at some point combined into one, so it is effectively one now anyway. Yeah. It, it, the town views it as one even though on the subdivision plan it's two. Okay. Right. So, so, so anyway, yeah, if, I, you could, if you and, could and I would, dig in on this. I, I, I really don't mean to sound flip, and I apologize if it does, but I would strongly look at every single one of the recommendations in this chapter because the last time we implemented the recommendations like this, it was called the land use package, and the result of implementing that land use package was a requirement to write a new comprehensive plan. It's why we're here tonight. <laughs> so um, these are hugely controversial, and you do want to be careful because um, some of the most important things you do are going to be very controversial. So just because it's controversial doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. But let's make sure you're getting getting what you think you're getting. So number 24, um, I think this was it, this was advocated by some members of the committee as an alternative to a development like Maxwell Woods. And that's, this isn't going to replace a development like Maxwell Woods. As long as people own property and they want to sell it, we're still going to have those types of development. So um, if you're not going to avoid a Maxwell Woods, are you going to open up sections of single family neighborhoods and say, well, some people can divide their homes up into multifamily units. So I'm just going to let you kind of roll with how that's going to feel. The infill lot was much more developed and it was um, looked at twice by the council 2000 and 2004 so maybe enough time has passed that we're willing to look at it again um, but it really is these old subdivision lots and you know as as chris said there there you know mountain view shore acres are classic neighborhoods where people uh, bought two or three lots built their house maybe in the middle of the two lots or maybe only on one of them and if they only built it on one of them and they have public sewer available, they could peel off the other lot and another house could be built. So we do have neighborhoods where people didn't buy two or three lots. They bought one house, they put the house on it, uh, one lot and they put the house on it and then there's a lot right next door that's the same size and they didn't build on it and the zoning changed and they can't build on it now. So these infill lots, they're very controversial. I just want to make sure it's clear because it doesn't matter if you're a lot 7,000 square feet and this other lot's 8,000 square feet. It's become in people's minds their little open space in their neighborhood. But from a fiscal perspective, this is a really potential gain for the town 
because pretty much all of these lots are on accepted town roads with public water and public sewer in the road. That means you're already paying to maintain the road, you, you've got all the infrastructure there, and you're taking a lot that's worth you know ten to twenty thousand dollars. Once you make it buildable, it could be worth a hundred thousand dollars. So if you think about that, that gain in terms of assessed value. Now if you, if you do what this says, this says make these lots that are less than 10,000 square feet that are on public sewer buildable. Um, you need to, I, what was discussed by the committee and they decided to leave it out is potentially putting in a floor. So when the, when the council discussed this in 2000 and 2004, they looked at lots between 7,500 and 10,000. And then they looked at lots between 5,000 and 7,500. So you, you kind of start to reduce the amount of opposition if you at least say, okay, we're gonna go from 7,500 to 70, to, from 10,000 to 7,500, because it's, it's a smaller subset. Does that answer your question? I kind of went on. Yeah, it does. I, um, again, what I thought my my takeaway from that workshop though was it, it wasn't necessarily to impact. Um, like, I, like we'll just keep playing Chris's example out with his own property, mm -hmm. where. Even though you've got that space, I don't know if you have a buildable envelope there and all that kind of, I don't know what other particulars there are with that, but the conversations that we were having at that workshop board that night really dealt more with these more obvious lots that were available. So I don't know if, this, right. if, if we were to ever consider and go forward with this, whether it just needs to be a much more tightly worded, narrowly defined, all that kind of stuff. Yes. Versus, because I, I and, and the count was, and you've got it here referenced, you know, approximately 41 lots based on this size, approximately 72 based on this. It wasn't all, however many lots there are in town, 3,500 or something like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess you could have people who have built their house on two lots say, okay, I'm going to tear it down. Well, that's pretty easy. You can just say vacant existing non-conforming lots, and then exactly. that narrows it down. Exactly. Yeah. And it says existing non-conforming lots. So these are lots that have already been created. They've been recorded in a subdivision plan in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Um, so there is ways to narrow it down. And like I said, I would also suggest you reconsider that yeah. idea of putting in a floor. And then the other thing was that the whole notion of this was that it was in already relatively densely populated neighborhoods to begin with, that one would assume, though Maureen makes the good point, that any parcel postage stamp of open space is, is, is you know, people consider it valuable. But if people are already in a more dense neighborhood to begin with, is there a greater acceptance for that as opposed to more either sprawling property or, or development layout and things like that? So anyway, it, it, I, I think if it's to be included, it needs to be more narrowly tailored, um, like what Maureen just described. Um, that doesn't address the first one, which is the multifamily home. That I think is separate. My my focus was more on the infill lot um, the proposal. So um, anyway, because I, I do think it is an intriguing opportunity for tax revenue. Um, just a question for Maureen: Do you think for next time or for later, um, you could just draft up a couple of other options that are a little more restrictive for us to look at? Um, or do you need more direction from us on what Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I could throw 7,500 or 5,000 in right now. Is there a feeling? Is that going to be... How many do I get for 7,500? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good idea. The 7,500 to 10,000 um, is what you were talking about as a floor, 7,500? I, I, I'm, I'm basically exactly opposite of Chris's position on this one. Um, I, I feel like, you know, these de already developed neighborhoods where we've already got roads in place, we've already got service and sewer in place, this is exactly where we want to be encouraging development because it's going to have the most financial gain for the town and the least impact, um, you know, on natural resources, on transportation infrastructure, I think. So I, I would 
be in favor of 5,000 or not necessarily even having a floor on this. I mean, you have to have a buildable envelope. We've got other requirements in place if you can meet the setbacks. My concern is less around the square footage of the lot and more around the existing vacant component. It, it does say evaluate, so that gives you wiggle room. Yeah. I, I'm fine with this 28 the way that it's worded because I think it gives us the opportunity to evaluate several options. I'm just saying that my personal preference is going to be toward allowing landowners to have more flexibility with developing lots, especially in these parts of town that are already well suited for development. Uh, won't say much again, but uh, I think that's uh, a great way to destroy a community in a neighborhood. Um, I, I totally see your point of view that uh, on why it makes sense in, in a vacuum, totally agree with you, but this, from my perspective, this will tear apart a neighborhood. But I could be completely wrong, who knows? So. Um, I would agree with Councillor Randall of, you know, maybe as, as we go through the evaluation and revisit this, maybe just look at a couple of different yeah. versions on this. That I, I, I can pull out the old yeah. memos, which I gave to the committee, yeah. and that kind of throws everything out there for you to look at and just make copies and send it out. Okay. Thank you. Um, did folks want to return to the multifamily, multiplex units? Oh, I have a comment about that. It, it sounds to me like people are talking about what's happening in um, like the West End in Portland, where they're turning big, huge homes into condos, like different, like flats almost. I don't know that we really have that kind of a personality in, in Cape. Do we really have neighborhoods where people would be turning them into condos? I don't know that that really fits with the character of Cape. I, I understand what they're talking about. Yeah. We would have more um, housing and maybe it'd be even um, less expensive because two families could live in a big house rather than just one. Um, but I, it just seems like it would change a lot of the dynamic of our neighborhoods and our community. And I don't know what your thoughts are. I, I guess what I would say is we might not have it now, but if we put it in, if we codify it in a way that it allows for it, we're, exactly. we're likely inviting it. And the thing that I'm drawn to is if you go back to page 62 in the housing tenure chart, you know, our biggest segment of housing stock is 80 years old. And, you, you know, as you think about this as more forward looking, you know, it won't be too long, regrettably, that more and more of those homes are going to be, you know, more financially attractive to a, to a prospective buyer or developer to tear it down and build something new on that lot mm -hmm. versus, um, you know, renovate or, or retain and so on and so forth. And, you know, given the option to tear something down and, you know, potentially extract more value from more more options. I don't, I don't know. I think, I think as, as Maureen said, you know, there's some very heavy consequences to some of these particular points in this chapter, and so I think I think that's something that merits a lot of consideration. So, I, I, I get concerned when I see the the age of some, you know, and some things are built great, and hopefully they're around for years and years to come, but others maybe not so much. And, um, so, anyway, Valerie. Um, so, with regard to that point. I personally am in favor of that, um, and I think also it would allow for a lot of people in my own demographic to get, I mean, I was really lucky to find the house that I did in the neighborhood that I could find it in, but um, I think a lot of people in my demographic can't move to Cape, and having that type of housing stock, it would make it an option for people who aren't falling into the um, affordable housing category, mm -hmm. but don't make enough to enter the housing market otherwise. However, just looking at the feedback, um, now I lost my page, on page 70, 
there isn't a ton of support for development of that kind of housing in the town. So I don't know that we want to go forward with something like that when you know the people who gave their input into this plan didn't necessarily want that. Yes. I guess um, part of where I'm coming from in looking at both of these proposals too is some recent conversations that have been taking place through the uh, Metro Region Coalition around affordable housing at a regional level. And um, I was fairly surprised to see the numbers of uh, new home starts that we have had in the greater Portland region relative to the number of new residents that we've gained over the last 10 years. Um, there's a huge, part of the reason we're experiencing the affordable housing crisis that we're experiencing in this region is that um, new housing starts have not kept up with population growth and so that just creates demand. Uh, obviously in Cape Elizabeth, land prices are relatively high, especially in these mature neighborhoods. So I think options that we can look at that um, allow for infill development and creating additional types of housing choices go a long way toward helping us make sure that we're playing our part in that supply of new housing um, and meeting that, helping to address that affordability concern at a regional level, I, we're still not going to add a lot of housing in Cape Elizabeth just because of the nature of the way, you know, our existing land use regulations and the amount of development that's already occurred. But I think these are two relatively small things that we can do that have the potential for us to, to help play our part in meeting the housing supply, whether it's designated affordable or not. We just need at a regional level to meet our, for our workforce, and you know, look at the numbers of folks who work in town who can't afford to live in town. Um, you know, that's something we need to be paying attention to. Maureen, these um, these buildings, these houses would have to be on sewer, correct? Do they have to be? Nothing that says this recommendation does not have any of that in it yet. Um, For multiplex, you say? Mm -hmm. And it I, could be a certain structure size. That, that isn't there yet either. Um, yeah. You know, I, I just remember this when we were talking about the land use amendments uh, four years ago. And we talked about allowing larger buildings on larger lots. And there was a huge push. And the more we refined it and the more we narrowed it down, the more people figured out it could happen next to them. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think there is that concern that you could start saying, all right, let's start refining it. And we say, oh, only houses that are larger than 3,000 square feet. Um, only houses that are larger than 3,000 square feet in sewer sewered areas. So you've now pushed it all up into the RC district, <laughs> and those folks are going to focus on it. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, mm -hmm. I want to throw out a question. Um, there's we're we're now relatively significantly behind schedule, and there's probably a lot more to discuss with housing. Um, so I'm either happy to entertain continuing the discussion we're having on housing and probably re-altering our schedule to accommodate the other things or stopping trying to get back to some of the other things and maybe we need a more, sp given the import and weight of some of these decisions, I, I'm, I'm just wondering if we maybe need a specific deep dive on the housing chapter yeah. altogether. What do you think? I'm in favor of deep dive, especially after we get some more of those materials. So, but, but let's be clear, I think we've got 10-year information and um, infill non-conforming lots, and that's the two pieces. Okay. And I just think perhaps some, some more thorough dialogue on some of the other things, too. I, I haven't heard a request for any other pieces of information, but I don't want to shortchange the discussion on housing. So my feeling is that we either need to go full bore on it now and keep going or move on 
in order to be you know, reasonable to our time frame here. I think we need to do the, the deep dive. I think we each need to kind of walk away and um, reflect on what we've heard. Um, I, I agree with Jeremy around we've got to start looking at our housing in a different way in order to achieve some of the goals we need to achieve from a, a, a regional perspective. So I say let's step back and then come back to this. That's my suggestion. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with personal principle and the idea of elected democracy too, and, and the point that Valerie brought up about um, you know the input that's been received, the discussion that's been had at the committee level. Um, so that's just something. I'm really caught on the I think it was, about, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Maureen, I, a couple times we kept getting mixed messages about affordable housing, about uh, we want to have more um, a diverse diversity in our town. We want to have, and there would be all these statements, and then when it came down to, okay, now in order to achieve that, these are the things. Well, I don't want that. I don't want that. But I want diversity. I want income diversity. I want cultural diversity. I want, um, I want to have it affordable so that people who work in this town can live in this town. So you'd hear all those statements, and then the results of uh, whether it be a survey or a work session or whatever would would be counter to it. And so that's, I was constantly feeling that we were getting mixed messages. Well, and I, think, uh, I think also there's overlay on that, a market component to no matter what we lay out here is the market reality of whether or not that's actually gonna happen, right? right? So even if you look back to the last comp plan and Maureen's admitted, you know, controversial and much debated uh, inclusion of higher density, mixed use, all that kind of stuff that was in the previous comp plan, there hasn't been this massive explosion. I mean, there's been some development in that regard, but not, you know. You're, you're never gonna have massive development here. I mean, well, no, I don't, that's not even the right, but I mean, there, there, there aren't, you know, you can count on almost one, one hand, maybe a couple fingers here next, of, of how many examples actually fulfilled that, you know, that objective. Right, yeah. right. So, if, if, if it, my experience has shown me over the years that, uh, I mean, like looking at these smaller lots, you have such a scarcity issue when it comes to developable land in the town as it is. Uh, case in point, the uh, Cottage Brook development, a lot of those homes are on 7,500 to 10,000 square foot lots. They're not inexpensive homes. It was absorbed very quickly, but even if you look at some of the infill lots that you're looking at, unless you've got a way to make them, if your genuine goal is for workforce housing or, or, or lower cost housing for different diverse groups to come into, that, I, I don't know if that's actually gonna solve the problem because those lots are still gonna be absorbed rapidly because they're in outstanding neighborhoods that people wanna be in and they're gonna sell at a premium and people are gonna improve them to the level that they're, so, so you've got a heck of a battle to try to solve, so I, I think, yeah, uh, you, you're gonna have to look at, a, as Councilor Reynolds said, a, a deeper dive uh, into this because it is a multifaceted issue to try to solve, and, uh, and Councilor Gabrielson is right, we've been talking about this at the Metro Coalition side of it, and uh, it's, you know, we're not, we're not the only town that's, that's facing this as a challenge as well, so, uh, and I think that's why your housing question in this chapter is such a challenge to try to find the answers to. And um, the other part, as far as conversion of like larger homes into it, you're not looking at a large sector of the of the housing market within Cape Elizabeth that would be easily converted uh, to that. You may find that it would be more of a shot of, uh, as, as Chairman Garvin said, taking something down and then building multiplex housing on that, you know, to, to reconfigure it so it's more efficiently used. But, so just to follow up what you said, on the top of page 74, 
um, it does say, if allowing development on undersized lots is intended to promote affordable housing, permanent affordable housing requirements should be attached to the lot buildability. So that recommendation 28, he's exactly right. Um, if you make those infill lots buildable because you want them to be affordable, you're gonna have to attach a restriction, and the good news is you already have a, a restriction already set up. The mandatory affordable housing provisions are already in the ordinance. We're already administering those. We know how to make houses permanently affordable. Um, but if you go with the infill lots because you want them to be affordable, you have to have both pieces because otherwise this is Cape Elizabeth, it's incredibly desirable. Someone will build a house on a 7,500 square foot lot and it will not be affordable. If I could, I know we, we kind of, it sounded like there was some appetite for sort of tabling this, but if I could, just looking at the recommendations that are included in here, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 26, and 27 are basically all continuing existing policies. We're really, there's really only three recommendations in here that envision any type of change. I would propose, and I don't think we need to make the decision tonight about what the change is, but I would propose, what if we just, what if we simply collapse 24 and 25 into, and we have the header under this goal of increasing housing diversity for to accommodate residents of all ages, groups, and size. What if we com combine these into evaluating options to uh, provide increased density and diversity of housing stocks, potentially including conversion of larger single family homes into multiplex housing units and amendments to allow cottage housing or something along those lines. We're not saying that we're necessarily going to do that, we're evaluating. That's, I mean, that's really the, the level of recommendation that we're at here. And then further discuss the infill one? We can further discuss the infill one now. Uh, we could theoretically throw that in with the, with the whole evaluation thing, but I, I, I feel like that is, there's enough, there's enough um, existing analysis in this chapter. And again, it's an, it is an evaluate, the recommendation is not to change, it is to evaluate options for, for doing that. Um, whether we want to throw them all in, I'd be okay with that, but I feel like there's enough analysis already within this chapter that we could, you know, that we can go with that as a, a fairly well-formed recommendation as opposed to the other two that still need a lot of um, What are people's thoughts? Uh, Adding the vacant onto 28 does, uh, in making it clear that what you're, that it reflects what you guys were intending mm -hmm. as opposed to someone that has it on, what's now deemed one lot and being able to carve it up. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that definitely does help and does make it clear that it's meant to be where you do have that random lot just sitting in the neighborhood. So I, okay. I, I, I see that helped. Yep. I, see uh, I mean, like all of these things, I mean, this isn't gonna be our last stand in the matters box on these things, so we'll, we'll get, you know, if people walk away from this and have other thoughts or we get more input, et cetera, we can continue to revisit before final approval. But um, for the purpose of tonight, it's, I, I think I'd like to move on and we'll see how much further we can get. We still might not get through all of this, but um, we'll keep plugging away. Okay. Because I expect the next conversation is going to go lengthy as well. <laughs> I just want to say, Maureen, you've been standing since six o'clock. Do you do you want a chair? Do you no, want to actually, sit? No, actually, I you? spend a lot of time in this building sitting, so this is fine. <laughs> okay, okay. I just, uh, I promise you, almost all the other chapters get easier. You're, you're That's what you good. always <laughs> say, Maureen. Yeah, That's sure what you told one. us too. But the, I mean, I, I did say that the committee organized these chapters, and these first five are like the real heavy hitters, and then it gets better. So the public facilities chapter, it's a big chapter, but I don't think it has the same amount of huge mm -hmm. public policy lift. 
So probably the biggest um, the biggest challenge is going to look at this looking at the schools. Um, I did update that table because it was such a controversial item, and the school enrollment is continuing an overall decline. Um, although there are years when it, it does bump up a little. Uh, there is a really interesting study I wanted to show you about um, home sales in children, and it's on page 83. Let's see if I can get this to move fast enough. So uh, we are looking at, we, we are concerned about, it, when you have an aging population, eventually they sell their homes. And what is going to happen when they sell their homes. And the assumption had always been that uh, they sell them to uh, people with kids and there's gonna be an impact on the school system. So um, in the 2007 comprehensive plan, we did our own little study. Uh, we, we picked the most recent completed school year. We were able to obtain the addresses of all the, the, the uh, homes that had sold in that year, and then we shared that with the school department, and they gave us the number of kids that came out of those homes before and after the sale. Um, and what's really neat is that we now, if I can get this thing to move, we did the same thing again. Um, so we can we have two sets of data, and I found it really interesting because in here we have finally. So in 2005, there were 158 home sales, and again we just picked a year that was the. This year is that, only existing home sales, not new construction. This is this is all sales. Actually, no, it was it was resales. Let me resales. correct that. So uh, before the sale, there were 30 children in those homes. After the sale, there were 116 children coming out of those homes. So a 387% increase in children on, the, when, on a one-year basis when homes were sold. So they're all existing homes. Um, we did this study again in 2016. We had a lot more sales. 230 homes were sold. Before the, the home was sold, there were nine kids coming out of those homes. After the home was sold, there were 20 kids coming out of those homes. So what that tells you is the assumption that people sell their homes to people with kids is true, but it's not happening at nearly the rate it was happening in 2005. And I, I understand there's controversy about our numbers, but this is, is all local numbers. And you could say, well, 2016 wasn't a usual year or whatever, but I think this is significant for the town to think about what the overall expectation should be for school enrollment going forward. And that can be separate from what you're funding. Um, but it's just important, if for no other reason, to tell you that the kind of housing that Cape Elizabeth is creating right now is not not appealing to young families with children to the level it used to. So uh, the other things I just wanted to point out that we, we did this huge review of uh, town facilities for the most part, and I'm not gonna repeat what's already in this chapter. I know all of you have already picked out that our firefighters have gone from 60 to 30, which is a pretty big change. I think the other theme in here is that the town has done a fairly good job of renovating facilities, and I think, I mean, me, I've been here a while, and I always think of the new public works garage and the new police station. Well, they're not new anymore. They're almost 20 years old and so they're not falling apart by any means, but they are getting to the point in the next 10 years when they're probably going to need some moderate investment and, and that's something to keep in mind. The other thing that came out of this study was for the first time that I have ever seen, the uh, committee is recommending that this town seriously look at expanding the public sewer system. And they, they talked about expanding uh, the system to cover the area around Great Pond because Great Pond is an important natural resource totally surrounded by septic systems. Um, they talked about potentially expanding the sewer to the southern end of the bus Business A district that's on Route 77. So that would pick up uh, the properties uh, south of the Bird Dog, uh, south of the Good Table. Um, and potentially looking at in by the sea. So um, that's another infrastructure ticket that the, the town may want to think about. So I'm going to stop and see if there's questions. Questions? 
And not a question, more just a statement. Uh, that type of data I find phenomenally interesting, and I'm really glad you put that in there. Um, so it, it, it's. Thank you. <laughs> I guess, yeah, or whatever. I, I could pontificate on that. But I agree. Yeah, it's I, just phenomenally interesting. I think that I've, I've been looking for stuff like this yeah. for a long, long time, yeah. so this is terrific. Um, what I'd love to even dive deeper on it is understand some of the macroeconomic factors that you might overlay on this, where, you know, the, the 2005. Uh, Point in time was you know pre-recession, 2016 is post. You know the prevailing presumption is that those at sort of the medium to upper end of the spectrum, you know, sailed through fine and you know are, are doing fine, but those not, you know, are are still finding themselves probably priced out of this market. And the other thing is, is that, that's maybe a more complex macroeconomic analysis that we don't need to bring to this. But one very specific thing that might enlighten these numbers a little bit more is I don't know if it's possible to just include what the median home sale price was for these two years for all these homes. Um, I don't know if we, if, if the, infra, I don't know if I these, would think that these we, sales are blinded or. We will do our best to do yeah. that. How's that? Because um, I think that, that alone might reinforce the point about um, it, it's, it's not the, It gets to the point of the type of housing stock and the affordability of it. So it, 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 it doesn't detract from the desire, I guess is the point, of, of people with kids to want to move here. And not to waste any more time because yeah. we are behind. But I also find it phenomenally interesting that in 2005, we saw a far greater number of people with children being willing to relocate, mm -hmm. whereas in 2016, suddenly it's the, like no one with it, it, the, the sale, as it notes, it's the empty nesters are the ones that are selling in 2016. Yeah. And, but again, um, this is. But even the 220% yeah. on, on a smaller base is yeah. still yeah. You know, significant. Anyway. Great, great um, piece of information there. So I, I would thank the IT department in the schools and our assessing department for making that possible. Um, other questions, comments people have on this section? So, I, I mean, I have a, what, what would be involved in that kind of sewer expansion? Uh, I believe we have a recommendation, and the recommendation would be to fund a study to look at it. Um, that I think that would be the very first thing you would, you would want to pick an area and um, try to come up with a preliminary design and a cost, because you'd need to know, you know, potentially you, you want to know potentially how many people. Not would on connect. the cost of the study, but any order of magnitude. If, if we were to follow through with all the recommendation. To, I mean, is there any speculative? I, I, I have no, no frame I, of reference, is my point. And, and, and I, I didn't. That's what the study would have to I, do. I, it would really be okay. a wag. You, you, have, you have had some discussions with, with Bob Malley mm -hmm. about this, uh, specific to the Hampton Roads neighborhood, mm -hmm. which is probably the. It's on the list. The primary candidate uh, for that expansion. Uh, it would be bonded debt, mm -hmm. um, similar to what what you had in the past, but it's a it's a twenty. I guess another way of asking is: Is there is, what would be the most recent project? I know, and I know costs would have changed dramatically since then. We but haven't that that is the point. Done. We okay. have not expanded okay. the sewer in any meaningful way since it was built in 1982. Okay. There was a tiny expansion to get to um, what was the old community center on Shore yeah. Road. There was a small um, extension to serve the northern end of the Business A district on Route 77, but there's been no. I mean, it's it's been such a hot point. Um, the only expansions have been done by developers. I, I know that the extension of the line uh, by uh, Joel Fitzpatrick down Spurwink Ave to serve Eastman Meadows was about half a million dollars for the construction. Okay. Um, I, not to belabor on this, but, but just out of curiosity, um, if the town 
elects to expand the sewage coverage area um, based on what's happened in other communities that have done that, what would be your expectation or about what would happen with existing septic systems on the sites that would then be served by public school? Well, my, my hope would be that the, they would be wholesale abandoned and people would say, hooray, and we're hooking up to the public, mm -hmm. the public sewer system. I think we'd have to, uh, what I would suggest that the study include to answer that question is what was the town's experience when it installed the, the system in 82? Because I know if you look at the sewer ordinance, there's all kinds of provisions about how close you need to be and if there was a payment, you had to do a readiness fee. And we'd want to look at what was our experience before to kind of inform us for the future? Thank you. I don't know. Naive question on my part. You, 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 may, you may find that, yeah, the, as Councilor Garber was just asking me about, uh, you, you may find that some homes are serviced by public water, but they are on private septic. So. Uh, there are some of those. Most of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the public fine. water is almost universal throughout the town. There's almost universal. There's, there's, there's some people who are on wells, and there are people who are on publicly supplied water, on private water lines, but I did a study on that many years ago, and it was like 98% of the town was on public water. Yeah. You have high subscription rates there, and then it's just a question of what you want to look at for your long-term needs regarding uh, uh, septic systems. And then, yeah, if you, if you did abandon it, I mean, you're looking at a thousand gallon vaults probably that are made out of concrete that uh, generally will, will, won't, won't be collapsing. It's more of the, uh, you know, just the abandonment of it and deciding what you want to do with the, the area that you don't have to worry about collapsing your leach bed in uh, anymore. I mean, the, the other point that was made is we, you know, the last time we really looked at septic systems was a while ago, and there are a lot of septic systems out there that are getting to the point where they need to be replaced. And this might, I mean, for people who have just replaced their system, they're not going to be happy. For people who haven't made that investment yet, this may be, this may be a unique opportunity to kind of do an intervention into some of these neighborhoods. Okay. So the goals are set up as uh, maintain, and that's just uh, that maintain those buildings as they're coming through that we think are new and not aren't new anymore. And then capacity issues. So we talk about staff turnover with the police department. We talk about the fire department. We talk about Riverside Cemetery. And you know that this is one of those recommendations that probably is gonna happen near the end of the 10 year period because this is supposed to cover a 10 year period. Invasive species, looking at funding. Um, you know, again, we talk about climate change, winter moths. And then number 34 is the potentially do the sewer study. And that's the capacity type question. And then we have this third goal that talks about modernizing. Um, and you know, 35 is reusing the police dispatch center if the historical society moves um, and develop the wireless communication strategy. So the, the discussion you've been having about broadband that's where it landed in the end, was in the public facilities chapter. Um, the challenge here is the town has constantly said, you want to improve wireless coverage, but you're basically expressing a desire and aspiration and looking for the private sector to step in and meet the needs. And if you're still asking for it, the private sector isn't really stepping in at the level that apparently you're hoping for. So, you know, you're kind of at the point. I thank you for smiling, Chris. I appreciate that. I fully understand exactly what you're saying because you're right. absolutely right. That's right. <laughs> so this is another one of those things where if you really want to make a difference, it may mean you have to put some skin in the game. So just to put some color on that, so we will have a dead zone in a number of regions of town, and the, there are dead zones, and they're created by the, the topography of the town, and the revenue to be generated is not sufficient such that any wireless company seems to have any interest in coming in and dealing with those. And it is what it is, and we might have to step up and do something if we feel it needs to be fixed. For example, Fort Williams, there's a dead zone there. Mm -hmm. 
prime bird tower that you can't see. <laughs> this recommendation doesn't commit you to fund anything. It just says, you know, relook at what you're what you're thinking about, and you know, you may go, you know, you may stay with the aspirational. If only we know the tall structure. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to keep going? Yeah. All right, so then 37 is review the Spurwing School report, fund repurpose, the council is already involved in that. Uh, develop a plan to increase recycling to meet or surpass state goals. I believe that, you know, the the um, recycling committee is, and that's an ongoing task of theirs. And then there is a separate goal four that deals just with uh, the school facilities. I would like to point out that the goal four talks about to repair and modernize aging school buildings, it, and it talks about maximize student learning and safety, and in no way suggests that investments need to be made in the school buildings because of capacity issues. Right. Maureen, is it elsewhere? Um, in the plan, I'm trying to, I'm going to flip it around. Um, it talks about like energy use of the buildings and, and source of energy and stuff like that. I think we put it in the future land use plan. Yeah, I know we talked about it. I think it's in the future land use plan. No, I can. Yeah, we talked about efficiencies and solar alternatives and things like that. I thought I remembered reference to it. Number 84. Mm -hmm. Incorporate renewable energy into town facility capital investments and educate the public about the benefits of renewable energy. So that's in that's on your agenda for next week. Was there any discussion from the committee about more specifically as it relates to public facilities, um, including more uh, I'm looking, sort of active I, or aggressive? I, I think it was steps. really there was really more of a global. We should all be doing it. I don't remember if, I, and I'm looking at Penny, see if she right. remembers. I don't I think remember there ever broad, being a desire to say just the town. Right. I think it was a broad, uh, the discussion had to do initially, I believe, it was about focused on the town, and then we talked about, but it's a whole community engagement that needs to occur. So how do we do it uh, from a town um, buildings and facilities perspective at the same time encouraging um, homeowners to do the same thing. I think that's where we... I we even think that there was an online forum question and there were some comments from people saying that, you know, we should be making everybody do this. Yeah. I think under goal three about modernizing existing facilities, I'd be certainly open to a more specific recommendation around that modernization, including um, energy sourcing and energy efficiency mm -hmm. upgrades. Cool. on facilities and services? I just had one brief point about um, recommendation 38. Um, given the changes that are occurring with recycling, is that specific goal something or specific recommendation something that we want to include 
or do we want to word it a little bit differently um, because the, the recycling world may be changing dramatically in the next few years and we'd want to promote sustainability obviously but maybe we, we don't want it to be exactly that recommendation. I think that's a good idea. The thing is, how would, it, how would we word it? Because you think about the, um, how um, recycling reuse is, is uh, morphing into something a little bit different. So is it about, uh, I don't know, aligning with the um, strategies that um, because eco main is a big part of this. Um, is it also about um, um, it's about reuse now? Yeah, that's where I was going to jump in. Right. That's the number one thing now. And so, do we start to morph this um, this strategy around around that? So what I would suggest, I think it's a good point of discussion, is um, something we talk about a lot um, over at EcoMain, uh, is aligning to the overall waste hierarchy strategy, which is mm. reduce, reuse, recycle, mm -hmm. um, uh, compost, and then a waste energy. That's a good idea. So it's a five-tiered um, thing. And so, you know, our recycling rates have been flat and stagnant for quite some time. Um, they're good recycling rates, um, particularly for a community that doesn't um, employ a pay per throw, pay per bag um, scheme. And so it's, it, it seems at this point unlikely that those numbers are going to move dramatically upward um, towards the state recycling goals, which I believe is 50%, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we're somewhere, I think, around 37, 38% on a good day, a good month. Um, so, um, but where we can continue to make dramatic improvements that have specific direct and fiscal impact to the community is by reducing the overall tonnage of material that's even going to EcoMain to begin with, because that's what we get charged for. We get charged for the tons of stuff that we haul over there. Um, those rates have gone up relatively recently, and now there's an additional fee that we've seen in this fiscal 2020 budget for even the recyclable materials. I think as Council Randall points out, the recycling market is going to change, you know, I, I don't think we want to have something in here that's too specific and locked in around a recycling market that's probably going to ebb and flow much more than it has in the last years. It doesn't mean it's going to be worse for us all the time, but if you think about recycling as a commodity market, you know, like any other commodity market, you know, soybeans and, you know, pig futures and stuff like that. The markets go up, the markets go down, and right now the markets are down for recycling. I, I would guarantee you that at some point they'll swing the other direction. So I don't think we want to have something that's necessarily so specific to that versus something that overall is about just reducing the amount of waste that is produced and reducing the amount of waste um, that is then in turn um, processed. Mm -hmm. So. I can try to put something together. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and on the EcoMain website, there's tons of information just about the waste hierarchy and stuff like that. So, um, or when their educator and outreach coordinator and the CEO are here in Cape in a couple of weeks at Community Services hosting an event, we can <laughs> go pick their brain. I think you're going to want this before then, though. No. Yeah. But, other points on services and facilities? Okay. Um, we're at 9.05. We've been at this for three hours now and have um, about half of our chapters that were on tonight's agenda left to cover. And in spite of Maureen saying that they're in decreasing levels of complexity and discussion, I just want to be mindful of everybody's time and how long we've been at it and so on. So what's everybody feeling? I definitely have fiscal capacity. Huh? You what? I definitely have enough bandwidth to take fiscal capacity <laughs> on. I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm fine. To well, that also can, that would conclude the first section yeah, if we did that. 
it would include the economy and infrastructure subsection. And then resource analysis, which begins with natural resources, would be what follows. So it's a logical place to stop if we wanted to do that. Well, let's do that. Yep. Then we can feel what sense. Okay. Out. Shouldn't be bad. <laughs> um, okay, so the fiscal capacity section, in, I mean, again, this is a, a section that has a ton of stuff in it that the state required. I spent a lot of time with the annual reports. Um, I think the key takeaways from this is that if you assume that in 2007, the town could sustain a tax rate that had $26 million in debt. Um, we're now down to $15.5 million in debt. Um, and it suggests that if it was a sustainable debt load before, that there is potentially $10 million in capacity to borrow and reinvest in capital improvements of some kind, which we have a whole book here helping you to figure out what you want to spend money on. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that the state does require a capital improvement program for 10 years. Um, what I have attached to this chapter is uh, fuzzy, literally and figuratively. So um, I am hoping that before this is submitted, this comprehensive plan is submitted to the state, that the council will adopt a 10-year CIP, that is both the school and the town um, investment. I'd like to point, for example, to page 111. Um, this looks a lot better than it is. Um, there's, I mean, when I was putting this data together, I, I can tell you there are, there are big holes in it, and I'm, I'm concerned that I, I don't want to have to submit this the way it looks right now. Um, for example, this little chart here on page 111 that's right behind you, I did my best to uh, add up all the identified potential improvements for a 10-year period for the town and for the school. And you can see that by the time I got to the last year, the schools had only identified $200,000 in improvements. And I have, there's no illusions that they have greater needs than that. Um, but obviously, the focus has been very immediate. And hopefully, we'll have a 10-year outlook very soon. So with that said, are there any questions? Because the recommendations in this chapter are, I think, pretty basic. Um, one, that you want to continue a capital improvement plan in a manner to efficiently and cost-effectively provide public infrastructure. Um, the number one recommendation is uh, improve coordination to adopt a unified town school capital investment plan. Um, periodically review bonded debt to balance appropriate indebtedness with funding for PAC capital improvements. Um, and then we're, we're talking about the town needs to balance residents' requests for services with residents' requests to minimize taxes. Um, and that has an implementation to execute the revaluation of all property. And I know you're aware that the assessor is gearing up to get going on that. Um, and then there's always the continue evaluate opportunities to generate new revenue streams to fund capital investments. And the council, obviously, you're working on that now. So, questions? The one uh, development that's taken place since the publication of the of, of this is that we do have uh, a new refined, larger picture as far as a 10-year capital improvement plan goes, uh, inclusive of you the mean bigger print. Or? Uh, <laughs> that too, Councilor <laughs> Jordan. <laughs> but uh, well, we have been working with that uh, over the course of the uh, winter and, uh, and endless spring uh, to get that together. So uh, we do have all that information over to Maureen, so we are trying to pull that all together into a fuller and um, a comprehensive report that will be ready uh, to go along with this. So it, it, it has refined the picture dramatically since, so uh, inclusive of the school department as well and working with the superintendent to try to identify some of those needs. We had a meeting, it was with the school department, with the new superintendent, it was very, it felt very, very positive. So. 
and the, as you noticed during the, uh, the budget process, we did have that one evening we were looking at the capital and uh, there was some discussion because as you saw, it did include some of the school capital needs that were identified for this year. So just to give the whole picture. So that's that one year snapshot that we have this year. Uh, you'll have that for years going forward. I have a question. Um, Number 40, recommendation 40, it says improve coordination to adopt a unified school, town school capital investment. What do you mean improve coordination um, between who? Um, what, uh, honestly, the 2007 comprehensive plan said adopt a unified town school CIP. I didn't want to put exactly the same recommendation in again. Um, it, it was very difficult to put this chapter together. So improved coordination was my polite way of saying, you, you know, you need to have a one unified CIP. Okay, it, it, it just doesn't, um, I'm not sure what's really recommending improved coordination. Uh, maybe there's a different way we can word it. Um, well, I could have written adopt a unified town school capital investment plan, but that seemed a little too in your face. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think the town planner hits the nail. Basically, both sides just need to come up with a list of here's what we need to do over yeah. the next 10 years and put it all in one document. Yeah. Because in the end, it's it's the same group of taxpayers that are paying for all those improvements. And you know, this chart I, I put up too. right behind yeah. you. You know, it, it's showing you the green is the town capital improvements, the blue is the school capital improvements, uh, but they're all being paid for by the same set of taxpayers. So you can see, um, is it the word improved? Yeah, improved coordination. Uh, is it continue coordination? It could say co yeah. <laughs> Because it's really just building off what already exists. As a friendly recommendation, perhaps take out to adopt a and uh, put improved coordination of a unified town school capital investment plan. But is it, does it need improvement? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's what we tried to accomplish okay. this year. To be, to be blunt, yes. <laughs> I, think it, I think it can be improved. Continuous. I think we've made improvements on the collaboration as it relates to the annual operating budget, and I think there's still a lot of runway ahead of us on the capital planning. Yeah. That's the way I would characterize it. All right. Very optimistic. And, and then on um, number 41, it says periodically. Do we want to put in um, sort of like in every other year or um, every, with, within every five years? Do I'm, we want to put I'm a time I'm really frame? glad you asked that because mm -hmm. in the last comprehensive plan, we made a recommendation to update master plans every seven years. Mm -hmm. And because of that recommendation, we updated the Greenbelt plan. And I think some of you remember what a fun time that was. Um, so I would actually not recommend a hard number because if you put in every other year and then you don't do it every other year, you've leave, you leave the town a little vulnerable. Well, you said you were gonna do it and you didn't. But if you wanna put a number in, I would just put a number in that you're really willing to stick to. just seems that it doesn't have any teeth if we just say periodically. I thought uh, we did it all the time. You're constantly looking at that, that balance. Yeah. So periodically here, it meant to me that we're doing it more than once a year, we're doing it ongoing. On a monthly, on a monthly basis, the yeah. council will see that as we are always the, looking uh, at finance reports that come, that come forward and they may not change, but, uh, but still you're looking at it and and are consistently being reminded of the amount. Uh, yeah, I, I think at the top of 113 in the chart that associates with that, it shows, you know, it basically says when possible, you know, as old debt's retired, you're introducing new debt, et cetera, et cetera, which leads to a question I have. Um, you made a very salient point at the beginning of the evening about data's good, but in the absence of comparison, it's just data. Um, two points here. The 
um, balance of capital improvements funded from the general fund and that from funding of new debt. Um, <clears throat> is that an appropriate balance? It, that, it, that is what you're... I, 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 right, so that's the actuals, that's what it is. Um, is that, I, I have no frame of reference if this is in line with what it should be or... I think, we're in, I, I think we, we're, in, we're in excellent position. Well, as and, far, I mean, as far and as it relates to fiscal capacity and what you were saying about in 2007, we were carrying this much more debt. I guess what I'm getting to is it sounds sounds like there's ceiling that has not been hit yet yeah, we're, we're on our borrowing capacity there. You're and probably closer and to the floor than yeah, the that, ceiling. Yeah, I mean, that recommendation that we're, that other one that we're dancing around, um, you know, I wasn't comfortable saying that number 41, increase bond to debt by $10 million and invest in infrastructure. But the reality is that you you seem to, I mean, because that's, that's a fiscal decision by the town. Do you want to take on taxes? And the next part of that chapter talks about, you know, people want, you know, people want stuff, but they don't want their taxes to go up. And you already have an affordability problem. If the taxes go higher, that just... It exacerbates, the, it exacerbates the problem, but it's this this particular slide right here where you you were in debt, um, you know, twenty seven million dollars, and and now you seem to be down in the probably you know fifteen, and this book identifies some significant infrastructure needs and capital needs. You could make forty one say, you know. Go, go go a little stronger and say, look at taking on approximately $10 million in debt to invest in infrastructure. But well, I, I, think I didn't reason, put that because yeah. it's, it's more bold. I think the reason this is really important for us to consider is twofold. Number one is capacity. Number two is um, the timing to borrow still is extremely favorable based on historical numbers. And that's probably going to swing in the other direction relatively soon. And so if you think of this as us having capacity and it's still being a favorable uh, uh, period, uh, you know, for borrowing funds, I think there's a lot of, you know, strategic and planning decisions that you have to weigh at that point to say, well, if we know that something is going to need to be done at some point on something, some big item, then do you just take your medicine now when it's it's going to be a lot more advantageous over the long haul than kick something down the road? Mm -hmm. So this is, I, you know, I think a very important point for us to focus on and, um, you know, make some actionable decisions coming out of this too. Yes. Matt? One, one of the areas that, you, that the town is... Uh, well, the approach we've been taking with the uh, lease purchase agreements on some of our big ticket items and that having that being paid for as you're using it, so to speak, uh, has been a strategic way to try to accomplish accomplish that by taking advantage of low low interest rates at the same time having a le lesser impact on the uh, on the tax rates while not also increasing that uh, you know so dramatically that 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 gap, I guess, between where we were, say, 10 years ago and where we are now as far as our bonded indebtedness goes. So it's, it's, it's an incremental approach, more of, a, more of a, I guess you could call it like a strategic approach to short-term debt to, to try to meet some of our long-term needs uh, when it comes to at least to, to, to physical capital uh, areas that we have. But if you're looking at something, say, uh, a shore road project or a large, large-scale uh, sewer improvement project or expansion project, that would be where you'd want to look at your at, at that gap in that, that $10 million range. Uh, and then and then the schools are a whole other paradigm that, that fit into this picture as well. Yeah. But, um, I mean, I remember, because I, I, mean, I was chair when we actually authorized the bonding on the recycling center. It was the most recent significant bond that we put out. And I remember sitting there and the office signing all those notes that, I mean, what a, what a incredibly, for the amount of money we were borrowing, what an incredibly favorable time it was to do that. Um, and I just think that that's something we can't overlook, that, you, you, you know, 
Chris. Uh, totally agree with everything you said. Those are incredibly astute points. Uh, absolutely stop spot on to the extent we do have larger projects from a interest rate perspective at now is absolutely the time to be doing them. Uh, but I wanted to give a little color on looking at this, our bonded in indeb indeb indebtedness. Uh, one would imagine looking at, well, why are our tax rates not dropping as we're uh, retiring all of this debt? And what we're seeing is basically we've been avoiding doing these long-term capital improvements because in conjunction with us paying off this debt, what's unfortunately been happening is the state has been slashing our revenue. So we do need to bear in mind the fact that Yes, our debt is going down. Our ability to service the debt should be the same, but at the same time, we're being we're also shouldering more of a burden of many of our expenses because we're no longer receiving the revenue from from the state. So, totally agree. Now is the time to borrow if we have these long-term projects. We know we eventually need to do, uh, but at the same time, part our capacity to handle it does need to be colored by the fact that we we have lost the revenue from the state. So. Mm -hmm. Both municipally and education. Yep. 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 Not just education. Yep. Other comments, questions? Okay. So let's stop there for tonight. Um, Maureen, I'll turn to you. Does it make sense to just pick up in this order next Wednesday and we'll rejigger the other agendas? Or um, do you want to yeah, I think go to what you had planned for the 15th? Then yeah, we'll come back to this. I really think you need to go okay. through these and. and Maybe we'll try to add some of next week's agenda onto this list because I think I do think yeah, yeah. <laughs> you'll get through it. Okay. Does anybody have any final points they want to make? Questions to ask? Requests of Maureen to bring to next week? Thank you, as always, this tremendous amount of work and appreciate your time here tonight, Maureen. And uh, if you're in touch with people from the committee, uh, continue to express our gratitude to them as well. So, Thanks. all right, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.